Well, hi, we are back for our big day. So welcome, welcome, welcome. We are so glad you're here. It looks like I'm live, so I would appreciate you just giving a shout out. I'm here all by myself for a little bit. We're going to have some guests show up in a minute. And I just had a tech glitch in which all of my notes disappeared from my Google Docs. So I just texted my tech team. And Diana, I see your picture there. If you could just text Martha again and tell her, I need my notes. I have no notes to go by. So this will be a three hour like free for all if I don't know who's coming when. So if you could just let me know we're live. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks for letting us know. We're going to be here for three hours. Now, I know that some of you may not be able to stay the whole time. It will be recorded for you. But I would love to hear if we're live on YouTube. There, there we go. Thank you, TW. Appreciate you letting me know. Thanks, everyone. I'm seeing your names on there now. Kim and Mandy, thanks so much. I'm so glad you're here. Oh, it's going to be an amazing day. As soon as we can get my notes back on my Google Docs, we're going to get started. But let me just review for you. We had Lisa Turkhurst on yesterday. Hi. Hi, Karen. Hi, Marcia. Nancy. Carol, so glad you're here. Welcome. We're glad you're here. How about YouTubers? Are you there as well? We just see, I just see one YouTuber. So if you're on YouTube, can you give us a shout out as well? Hi, Tammy. Good to see you too. YouTubers, any YouTubers there? Let's see who's here. Let's see who's here. I'm going to refresh my computer to see if my Google Docs come back and they do not come back. So not sure what happened here, but everything has disappeared. So I'm in big trouble. Um, on my computer. It's not on my computer, Martha. So whatever happened, I don't know if I have to shut it down and restart it, but um, I'll do that in a minute. So I'm just going to wing it because I have no notes here about what I'm supposed to do next. Hi. Hi. Welcome. So glad you're here. So in our workshop, we talked about four beliefs, four beliefs that you have or might have that keep you stuck in a destructive marriage, right? Does anybody remember what those beliefs are? Does anybody remember what those beliefs are? Put them in the chat. Belief number one was that what? Belief number one was what? As you're doing that, I'm going to try to get back onto my Google Docs, but I'm not sure. Everything looks blank on my end, Martha. So I'm going to close it out and go back into the calendar uh, and put it in. But last time I did, it didn't work. So you're going to have to help me here. You may have to send me a Word document or something that I can read. I can't read it on my phone. Sorry, it's too small. And look in the camera at the same time. So what was the, yeah, would you like to connect? I'm not sure. Oh, this, are you talking to somebody else, Nancy? I'm sorry. I'm, right, what was the first belief? Anybody remember what the belief was? The first belief. All right, I'll give you a hint. Compliance equals submission. That if I just comply, that's biblical submission. I have to comply. I have to do what my husband says. Biblical submission does not mean compliance. Or it wouldn't say submit one to another, would it? Because then that means you have to comply to everyone and everything. No, it doesn't quite mean that. And so submission is a wonderful discipline of the heart that teaches us that we don't need to get our way all the time. And that's really important in families so that we get along. But it doesn't mean always compliance. And so it doesn't mean headship doesn't mean a husband gets his way all the time or that you don't have any voice or choice. So that's one belief that keeps us stuck in destructive marriages. A second belief that gets us stuck in destructive marriages is that I have to do the heroic sacrifice. Suffering and sacrifice are noble virtues, and God calls me to suffer in my marriage and sacrifice myself to keep my marriage alive at all costs. That's what pleases God. And we looked at 1 Peter 3, and we saw that Peter tells us to suffer for doing what is right, for doing what is good. Don't suffer foolishly. Don't suffer to enable someone else. Yesterday, we had Lisa Turkhurst on our Facebook and YouTube channel. I hope you loved hearing her story about her own healing. But one of the things Lisa says is God is not asking us to sacrifice the best of who we are in order to enable the worst in someone else. So when we suffer and sacrifice to enable someone to sin against us repeatedly or against our children to cause more damage to our spirit, soul, body, our finances, and we just... Think that our noble sacrifice by suffering, and I mean, would you just stay silent if your husband was driving the car straight off a cliff? No, you wouldn't, and you shouldn't. But yet, somehow we believe that that's noble to, to suffer and sacrifice, and that God calls us to. He doesn't. What a good wife does is she loves her husband, even if he has to be the enemy for a moment or a season. She loves him by speaking the truth in love. 
by allowing natural consequences to hopefully wake him up. Sometimes they don't, a lot of times they don't, but she certainly doesn't put herself in the way of the consequences because then he will never wake up. Sometimes we get in the way of what God's trying to do to wake them up. Because like Lisa said yesterday, we're so afraid his consequences aren't going to be our consequences and our kids' consequences too. And you're right. You're right. But that's where fear or faith comes in. Are we going to trust God that he hates what's going on and he calls us to walk in faith? Or are we going to try to solve our problem through the remedy of fear, fear-based solutions? The third lie that we tend to believe is that there is no option because God hates all divorce. And we talked about the mistranslation in Malachi 2, where it doesn't say God hates divorce. What he hates is when a man divorces his wife treacherously, when he uses her and tosses her away like a used tissue and then picks another wife, a younger wife. God hates that. He hates a casual disregard of your marriage vows. He hates treating someone as an object. In Proverbs 6, it talks about what God hates, and never in those lists of what God hates does he says he hates divorce. He hates the things that cause divorce for sure, like pride and selfishness and lying and cruelty and oppression. But divorce, he actually implemented because of the hardness of people's hearts. Yes, marriage is meant to be lasting for a lifetime. It's meant to be a sacred institution. And because of the hardness of heart and man and women's sin, divorce was permitted for certain reasons. And that takes us to our fourth lie. And the fourth lie is this, that I don't matter. That I don't matter, not only I don't matter to God, I don't matter to my husband, I don't matter to myself. And therefore I just have to keep putting up with this because I don't matter enough to myself to protect myself, to steward myself, to, to help myself. All right, so I'm going to take a break and see if I can pull up my Google Docs. I can't talk and do computer stuff at the same time. So hold on. Let me see if I can do this. Somebody yeah, who did that? I can't even get my computer to work now. My computer's frozen. Hold on. Here we go. Just hold on. Let me get my Google Docs up. There we go, yay. Thank you, God. <laughs> I can remember a lot of stuff, but I can't remember three hours worth of stuff. So thank you so much, Lord, for and your prayers. So what are those beliefs that you believe that you get stuck in? As you watch the workshop, what belief? Belief number one, that compliance means submission. Belief number two, that suffering and sacrifice are noble virtues that God calls me to in this destructive marriage. Belief number three, God hates all divorce. Or belief number four is that I'm just not enough. I'm not enough to matter, especially to myself. Yeah, Kathy says number four, number four. Yeah, there is going to be a replay, Janice, because uh, obviously people aren't going to be able to stay. Everybody's going to be, not be able to stay for three full hours. So we'll be taping this and you can watch it later. Yeah, belief number four. So that's the belief I want to talk about today. We're going to have guests. So let me tell you how today's going to roll. We have a three-hour packed event. Now that I have my notes, I can tell you what we're going to do. I've invited three sisters, Conquer sisters, who are in our Conquer membership, have been for a while, and they're going to share with you how Conquer has helped them get through these four beliefs and some, how they have gotten stronger, how they've gotten healthier, what's happened in their marriage. And we're going to have our coaches come and share with you what <clears throat> they have loved about being in our team and on Conquer. Parts of the Conquer journey that have been really meaningful to them. And so we're going to have three guests. We're going to have three of our co three to four of our coaches present with us too. And then I'm going to answer some Q&A. So that's how today's going to roll, okay? Yeah, believe four. Believe four. Number me. Yeah. I, I think that was key for so many people. And that's why I really wanted to talk about that today. So I'm going to ask, ask you to... Pull up a pen and paper. I'm going to ask you to think about a question as we get started. <coughs> because I believe that the next three hours together could change your life. All right. So I read something recently that caused me to press pause. And I want you to write it down for yourself. It says this. Human beings 
are not driven by the past, but we're pulled forward by the future we're most committed to. Or I would say we're pulled forward by the future that we most want to create. So what is the future you most want to create? What is the future you most want to create from today forward? What is, what is the next step for you that will enable you to create the future you most want to create? And I'm not just talking about, oh, I'd like to have a cleaner house or I'd like to move someday or I'd like to have a better job. Those are perfectly fine goals. But if we never think about where we want to go, we'll never get there, right? So having a new job or a new house or those kind of things, even a clean house this weekend, that's one future I'd like to create, right? Those are great goals that we think about. But unless we think about them, they're not going to happen, right? So unless we think about what we want to create, it's not going to happen. And so what is the future about who you are and how you think, even about these four lies, that I'm not worth I don't matter enough to take care of me, to steward my safety, to steward my mental health, to steward my body, to steward my emotional health. What's the future of that if you keep that path going? Is that the future you want? I don't think anybody would say yes. So what is the future you want? for yourself, for your kids, even for your marriage. Now you can't control all those variables. Like the future I want for this afternoon is for it to be nice weather so I can go out and walk. I can't control the variables of the weather, but I can control my time and my shoes and my body and get out there and walk if it's nice out, right? I can do that. But if we don't even think about that, we're not gonna get there. So your past might be horrible. It might be full of trauma. Or maybe even your past is pretty good, but your present is a mess. Your marriage is destructive and you're just not sure which way to turn right now. But the most important question now becomes not why is this happening to me? Why doesn't he love me? Why aren't I a good steward of myself? Why don't I matter? Those questions are interesting questions. They're kind of sometimes nowhere you don't go anywhere. You just kind of go in a circle in a rabbit trail because is there really a why to all of that? Or is a better question a what question? What kind of future are you committed to creating for yourself and for your kiddos? And what will you do to create the kind of future self for you that you would be most proud of? If you knew that you had total power to write the next chapter of your life story, not about the circumstances. You don't know the dilemmas that your their heroine is going to get into. You don't know all that. But if you could create the heroine who would face those kind of circumstances with strength and dignity as her clothing, what would be different about you? What would your future self look like that would be able to create the kind of life circumstances? or make them more possible, more likely. So take a moment and just write down some thoughts. I'd love to hear what you're thinking because unless we think it, we won't create it. And even when we think it and create it, I just wanna press pause for a minute. Sometimes it doesn't turn out the way we want. And that's okay, that's okay. And this is where the self-hatred comes in because when we mess things up, when we make a mistake and we mess things up and we get really mad at ourselves, we're tempted to give up, aren't we? So I, br I brought this picture. Now, some of you know that I've been trying to learn to paint over this last year, and this is a picture I did paint, okay? But I'm gonna show you a picture I'm working on and I've really messed her up. I've really met, because I'm trying some new things. She looks terrible, I'm embarrassed to show her to you, but the Lord <laughs> put her on my mind to show you that we get stuck in the messy middle. So this is the messy middle. She looks terrible, doesn't she? I've already erased her eyes three times. So this is an erased eye that I'm trying to redo, but I don't really even like this eye yet. I don't like her hair. I don't like her face. Her face is too long. It's just a mess. It's a total mess. And I'm going to keep working on her because my future self wants to be a good artist. 
My future self wants to know how to fix these things. And I can't even learn if I'm not willing to make mistakes, if I'm not willing to get stuck in the messy middle. It's tempting to just take this and throw it out and say, oh, I'll just start over. I can't do it. But it's more challenging to take what you have as messy and as ugly as it is right now. That picture looked messy and ugly also at one point. The old lady that some of you saw me paint looked messy and ugly at one point, okay? So I want to encourage you that if you want to be healthy and strong going forward, what might you need to do in the messy middle? What might you need to do differently? What decisions might you need to make differently about your self-care, about how you show up? How do you want to show up? Name that and put it in the chat. I'd love to hear that. I'd love to hear. I'd love to hear what you're saying. Some people are having some tech issues, but we're clear on our side. So I'm not sure what's happening on your side, but we're good here. Yeah, welcome everyone. Yeah, the picture behind me looks like me. That, thank you. She looks about 20 years old. I'm much older than that, but, but thank you very much. Um, but yeah, the messy middle, we're, we're creating a life and we don't like the way it looks. It doesn't look the way we want it. Where do we want to go? What do we need to learn to get there? Peaceful, whole, confident. Janice said, I love the cards I received. Thank you, Janice. I want to be fearless. I want to peace, be peaceful. Okay, what does that look like? What are your next right steps to get there? That's the question. You see, if you know where you want to go, you're more likely to recognize when you're not there, uh oh, I'm not here yet. I'm not here. I don't know how to draw eyes as consistently as I thought I was learning. I've got to figure this out. What am I, what mistakes am I making? Why is her face so long still? I'm measuring and it's still not right, right? What's going on? I'm asking myself questions without beating myself up. See, I care about how I show up as an artist. I want to grow in that area. Of course, I'm going to make mistakes. So what do you do to move forward in those mistakes? Yeah, stop letting yourself be stuck. And one really important thing is if I had a couple buddies who were artists, if I was in a support group with artists and I could say, I'm really stuck and I'm not sure what to do with this girl. She's a mess. Somebody would say, oh, th her left eye needs to be lifted. That's the problem. Or her chin needs to be pointed more. It's too round or whatever. I'm not sure I see what's wrong. And that's what Conquer does for you. It gives you a support system of people who are on this journey with you. Some of them might have been a little further along than you are that can help you see this is, this is a mistake here. Or I think this, this isn't going to take you where you want to go. If you use this color, it's going to mess things up more, right? I don't know all that. And so being in a group with other women who want the same things, yeah, Connie says, I love that you're not giving up on her. I'm not going to give up on her. I don't know what she's going to look like at the end, but I'm not. She might have 25 coats of gesso over her, but she's going to come out as gold. But that's our life, isn't it? That's our life. Don't give up on you. Don't. You may have to accept reality about your marriage because you can't control his side of the street. Lisa said very wisely yesterday, she doesn't like to use the word giving up, but sometimes you have to accept the truth that he's not interested in creating the kind of marriage you want and you need of safety and mutual respect and honesty and faithfulness. He's not interested in that kind of marriage. He's just interested in the kind of marriage where he can use you and abuse you and treat you as he wants and lie to you and mistreat you and still get the perks of marriage. Why would you let someone do that to yourself and call that a good relationship? It's not. So why would you lie to him and lie to yourself? That's not healthy for either one of you or your kids. So if you want to create the kind of future, you might meet in a messy middle for a while. It's okay. We want to help you go forward. <clears throat> but don't give up. Don't give up. Adriana says, I want to finish this very long, very hard process of divorce. I want my health to improve. I've been supported by the Lord. I want to get past the depression. 
from being honest with myself. Yeah, sometimes it's depressing to look at reality. Even it was depressing to me. I'm thinking, I thought I knew better. I thought I knew more than I knew. I mean, I painted lots of pictures and every one of them goes through those stages. So I, I should know that. But this was a smaller one. I've never done a smaller one of that kind of thing. And so it's harder to do it in the right proportions. And so understand when we try new things, there's always a messy part of it. And that's why it's so important to invite people to help and support you. So I'm encouraging you. Conquer is open until Tuesday. If you have not signed up yet, I would encourage you to join our group, take a risk, take a chance, and put yourself in a support system. If I could put myself in a support system of other artists who were learning and I could have conversations with them, I would in a heartbeat. It would be well worth it for me to do that. So if you have that opportunity to do that, and this is where your journey is, and you can be among Christian faith-based women who understand your value structure, because other groups may not. Other groups may advocate, give it right back to him, hate him. He's hurt you, hurt him back. That's not our way. That's not God's way. You know, I was reading in 1 Corinthians 13 about what love is. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not demanding their own way, right? So love accepts reality. Love rejoices in the truth. And you can be loving and still not have a loving marriage or a loving relationship or even a safe marriage. But the temptation when you don't get what you want is to turn into hate. And so in 1 Corinthians 14, it was really a very powerful verse that stuck up to me. And he said, love is the most important thing. Understand, sister, that your husband may not love you. Probably doesn't if he's treating, he doesn't love himself either, probably. He's selfish, he's blinded, he's deceived, he's sick or whatever, however word you want to use that. But he doesn't love well. But if you're not taking care of you, you're not loving well either. Love is the most important thing. You can only fix you. Don't let his hatred of you, of God, of life, of himself, his selfishness, his pride, his narcissism destroy you. And what Satan means to do is not just destroy him, but destroy you. He wants you to hate. He wants you to repay evil for evil. That is not God's way. God does call you to steward your safety and your mind, guard your heart above all else. <clears throat> and I am having hoarseness problems. So we're going to move into our next step. I'm so glad that you have shared what some of your future self. Yes, you, the biblical perspective is so important to you. Yes, I'm reminded of the Israelites in the Old Testament. God physically delivered them from their enemies. Yet they longed to go back to Egypt while wandering in the desert. Yeah. Sometimes we want to go backwards instead of forwards. And that's why it's so important, Amanda, for us to have a vision of our future self. What kind of self do we want to be? Because that self writes the next chapter of our story. We see in movies the heroine change from being the victim to being the hero, right? Are they being oppressed to kind of coming out stronger? Those are the movies we like anyway, right? Elsa. I mean, what if she had stayed frozen and Anna? What if she had stayed attached to that man who was using her? And so they grow through the story and then they write the next chapter from a new place in themselves. They still have obstacles. They still have challenges, but they're different. So we want to invite our first coach up. I'm going to invite coach Diana to come to the front of our, hi, Diana. Hi. Thank How you is so my audio? Can you hear me clearly? Are you really well? Really okay. well. Thanks so much for coming and being a, a part and being there early so I could say, Diana, help me contact Martha. I can't put my notes. <laughs> Diana has been with me forever. She's been a good friend. She's been one of our coaches. Uh, as soon as I realized this was getting bigger than I could handle, uh, Diana was one of the first women that I contacted about helping me and being one of our coaches. And one of the things <clears throat> I appreciate most about Diana, she lives in Ohio. She has got such a tender heart. And she has a value that I have. She loves to learn. She's always learning new things. I really love to pick her brain about the books she's reading or the things she's learning. And she really has a love for our women. 
The other thing that Diana is really good at, um, I would say she and Susan are so good at just paying attention, just paying attention to what's going on in your body. And recently the Lord has shown me, Diana, and I don't know if I've shared this in the coaches meeting or not, but it's just been really powerful that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Mm. So if our body warns us of something, I think we can take that directly from God. That if our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and our body is warning us, something's off, something doesn't feel right. You're not, you know, you're not functioning very well or something's kind of scary here. Pay attention because the Holy Spirit is living in our body and he's using our body to communicate. I'm really happy to be here, Leslie. And you know what? That is so true. Um, and I think that speaks to our population here. Um, sometimes we feel things before we can put words to it. And, um, you know, I love what you talked about. Um, it helps not to be alone, doesn't it? I mean, even having me in the background, you weren't all alone in maybe your confusion and trying to figure out what was going on. I wow, like my Google Docs disappeared. Right. <laughs> what happened? But, yeah. you know, there's uh, there's so much going on, and I'm sure that um, our audience is here for a purpose because of really what they're experiencing. And the body is the first clue, and often it shows up in in fear, anxiety, confusion, um, and it helps not to be alone. Mm -hmm. And I know what your first question is going to be: What do I love most about this? And I have to tell you, I love the fact that we're not alone. And I hear that across the board when we're doing our coaching groups, when I'm doing conquer calls, and when women have a chance to talk and get to know one another and meet one another. It's so refreshing that they're not alone in this journey. Yeah, and I think the other thing that I found, we did a welcome call of our new conquer members last week um, mm -hmm. for those who signed up real fast. And it, it, they were just, it was just not only am I not alone, but I look at these two women that were in a breakout room with me and they're normal, they're beautiful, they're lovely and their husband treats them that way too and there's nothing wrong with them. And it really helps you to see it's not about me. And that's very powerful. Diana, we, you've been with me before we'd ever started our Conquer journey. And so we've done this Conquer journey now to help women because when you join Conquer, it can be overwhelming. There's hundreds and hundreds of videos of teaching on all different topics. And it's like, it's like hitting a road with 50 different roads. Where do I go? And so we put this journey together for our newbies of eight, um, a few videos, six steps, zero to five, actually. So it's zero is one and six steps mm -hmm. of awakening and then safety. Are you safe physically, emotionally, mentally, financially, spiritually? Um, are you clear on what God says about what you're going through? Can you really feel his presence with you that he not only are you not alone because you have sisters with you, you're not alone because God is on your side. He hates when you're being oppressed. And so really getting clear on what God says about abuse in the Bible so that you're confident about what you're doing and then growing in the next steps. What's What's been your experience in helping women walk through the, the conquer journey? Well, often you don't know where to start, right? And what I love about the conquer journey, the steps to the conquer journey, the first eight weeks that you're in conquer, you are guided into all of those tools that you need to help you with your vision, to, to, to envision your future. And um, it's very comprehensive. It's specifically detailed to outline foundational truths. And it's formatted in a very active manner that you can apply to your life. So you're already getting your, you know, getting your footing and you're taking the next right step if you're working with the material. And then we meet with live members during that time to answer questions, to discuss how to apply it. And um, Leslie, the material um, that you have developed is, is based on the word of God and biblical truth. And sometimes we know the word of God, but we don't know exactly how to apply that to our life in a real living way. And that's what I love about the Conquer journey. It's been very powerful um, since we implemented it. And because um, we don't want you to flounder any longer. Yeah. So what are some of the outcomes you've seen women take or, or receive as they've begun to stop focusing on changing him and start focusing on changing them? Like whether it's the safety step or the, the stability mm -hmm. step or the strengthening step, what outcomes have you seen as they have taken this material and actually put it in practice? Because 
I could read about painting. I just read a book on painting yesterday and I practiced some of the things that she was telling me and it was a mess. But if I didn't even practice, it just, you forget it really fast. I see so many, uh, oh mercy, I see so much change, transformation, um, the ability to see things with clarity, to focus on what the real issues are and um, a change in um, maybe how I address the situation, a change in my behaviors. I see an increase, an increased amount of hope for the future, which I think is huge. And, um, you know, certainly a desire and a, a greater understanding to know what my calling is and to live that out. I know you said earlier when you were speaking how the enemy is trying to get to uh, us through circumstances and other people in our life. And one of the ways that he does that is by robbing us of our self-worth and our purpose and our unique calling in God. And when I see people grab a hold of that, they're no longer tormented with the intrusive emotions, right? And um, there's a greater sense and a determination to come alongside one another and just changing inside the families, changing for children. Um, yeah. Yeah, one of the things that we talk a lot about is your children need at least one healthy parent. And I love when the lights go on for women to say, wow, even if my marriage doesn't make it, I'm going to make it. That's a huge mindset shift because when you don't value yourself and you don't feel important enough to matter to you, then you're clinging to him. You're clinging to him so that he takes care of you, so that he loves you, so that he validates you, so that he doesn't hurt you. And he has all the power and you have all the vulnerability and you're scared to death because if he leaves, I can't, I don't value myself. I don't know how to take care of me, not just financially, but even emotionally, even mentally to think through things. And so Conquer helps women gain that inner strength of confidence and dignity that even if their marriage doesn't make it, and we hope it does make it because as you get stronger and healthier and can show and speak the truth in love instead of reacting in anger, um, that may cause him to press pause and say, wow, I've got a lot to lose if I keep this behavior up. Yeah, it's huge. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a huge change in how I see myself, how I see the world. And um, I don't have to be in this all alone. Um, there's guided steps. Um, I can now learn how to walk out um, my life uh, with certainty. And like you said, strength and endurance. Um, you know, I think I hear two words, healing and freedom. And I think of freedom from oppression, <laughs> freedom from control. Um, and there's so much confusion about our role as women. And um, some, some, some of us have been taught inappropriately what the scriptures mean. And so we untwist all of that in a way that's really helpful. Um, and, you know, if you've been in, in a relationship for 10, 20, 30 years, and certainly um, you've been guided by the wrong application of scripture, it can be so soul defeating. And we, we want to live out this life well. We want to finish well. And that's the committed goal is to renew your spirit. Um, apply the truth of God rightly and um, and do it in this in in the course in the context of community you know Leslie you've taught me all these years that we heal in the context of community and I get to see it all the time as we're working with our women yeah Lisa said that yesterday as well she said when trust is broken in relationship you can't rebuild trust all by yourself. And so you need community to learn who's trustworthy, who's not trustworthy. You might not be able to rebuild trust with your spouse, but you do need to know how to trust yourself in discerning who's trustworthy, to trust others and what that does that look like and trust God and that healing of your trust when you've been betrayed. It's so hard to trust even yourself because you've so believed in this person and you're thinking, what was wrong with me that I didn't see the signs earlier? And so this Peace of community cannot be um, overstated. I don't think you can do this work of healing relational trauma in a vacuum. Or even, I don't know that you can do it well just one-to-one -one with a therapist. You might need a therapist for some trauma work and those kind of things. I don't, I was a therapist, Diana's a therapist. We're not saying that's not important. But I don't think if you just had a therapist and you still were all by yourself, 
you would be able to do the work because you have to live in the real world and you need real people to practice with. Just like I have to practice my real paintbrushes, everything I'm learning in real time, painting a picture, you have to practice these things. And so one of the things that we create this community for is for you to practice even on the Facebook page and talking with one another, how to listen, how to speak up for yourself, how to disagree in a good way, how to discern who you like and who maybe you can, you know, hang out with, but they're not going to be your bestie. Those are all important things to learn about who you are and what's important to you. And all of the curriculum is specifically designed to help you get there. And that's the piece you take away from it. Often in therapy, you're trying to figure out what's next, where do I need to go? And that's what I love about our community and the resources that are available, Leslie, because it's, it's guided. Um, and so, you know, in a destructive relationship, there's not a lot of clarity and there's a lot of confusion. And I just don't mean mental confusion. Your physical body is filled with that as well. So taking the guesswork away and just diving in with support of others is refreshing. Mm -hmm. And um, I see in the chat, someone said, Conquer saved my life. Literally. I hear that all the time. Um, I hear that all the time, too, when I especially when I go speak somewhere, people I don't even know come from everywhere to mm -hmm. say that. And I think there there is real truth to that because you learn what to look for. We've had and I don't I don't want to camp on this, but we've had a couple of women in Conquer whose husbands were dangerous and they ended up killing themselves. And I believe if they had not been in Conquer and learned the safety plan, um, it could have been much worse than that. And we read about this stuff in the paper every single day. And so if that's you and you're listening and you've been threatened or you feel in danger, you need help and support to develop a safety plan. That's why we put that number one step, because there's some of you who are that in that much danger and others are in different kind of danger, especially spiritual danger and financial danger, that you have to understand what, what is happening. Because if you don't, you're going to end up more harmed than, than not. And we don't underestimate um, the, the physical and uh, the physical danger that's impacted by the emotional um, and um, dynamics of course of control and power and manipulation. I mean, if you're early on in the relationship, you may not be feeling those as intensely, but uh, enduring that for uh, a decade um, can have dramatic impacts on your body, your ability to make good choices. And so literally we're talking about life-saving in all aspects. Yeah. I would love to get some feedback in the chat. Um, two things. One is how many of you are struggling now with some physical illnesses, especially autoimmune illnesses, um, you know, fibromyalgia, all the different kinds of inner body issues that we get when we've lived in a intolerable situation. Our body keeps the score. Basil van, van der Kolf's book says it, the body keeps the score and research is now showing that preborn children are affected by their parents' marriage. Trauma can be passed down in the DNA that your body is impacted by the stress that you live with day after day, after day, after day, your body's impacted by the secrets you keep in your body day after day, after day. And those of you who are married, you know, under 10 years, you might not get that feeling yet, but those of you who've been married 20, 30 years, we hear over and over again, women who join our group, I can't, now I can't get a job because I'm so sick. I don't have the strength to work. Now I'm stuck. I've gotten so sick from what's happened to me emotionally that it's impacted my body physically. And sometimes we've been living in this so long that we have these defense mechanisms built up and we think we're doing okay and we're ignoring those signs. And um, I think a part of what we learn and conquer is becoming aware of all of that dynamics. And, and when I talk about clarity, um, putting aside those um, defense mechanisms and maybe some of the denial to really begin to address those things that will have life impacting um, decisions on your future and your children's future. Yeah, yeah. That's so wise, Diana. Thank you so much for being a part of our live stream. And Diana, again, is one of our longest 
coaches on our team. And I'm so grateful. I could not do this when all of a sudden Conquer started exploding. I, Conquer was started as an afterthought for people that I was coaching and counseling after I'd written my book. They still wanted to connect with one another and meet one another. And so we had 40 people in Conquer and it was just people who I'd worked with who just wanted to kind of touch base with me once or twice a month on the phone and, and ask questions and continue to do their work. But they didn't really need counseling or coaching as much anymore. They couldn't afford to pay for that. So we started it. And then it started growing and growing and growing and growing. I thought, oh my gosh, I can't do this by myself. And so Diana was one of our first people that came on board to, to partner with me and help me. And so I appreciate you so much, Diana. I am grateful and blessed to be here. Thanks, Leslie. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. That was wonderful. Let's give a, a thank you to Diana for her wisdom and her support for all of you who are in Conquer. And I would love for you to take a moment. And what was your biggest takeaway from what Diana shared? What was your biggest takeaway? If we don't press pause and kind of think through what we're learning, sometimes it just kind of goes in one ear, out the other. I've heard over and over again, people say, even in, you know, their faith. Yeah, Leslie, I know that, but I just don't know that. Like I know it up here, but I don't live it here. I know God loves me, but I don't feel loved. I know he forgives me, but I don't feel forgiven. You know that, right? So what was your biggest takeaway from what Diana said? What was it that spoke to you? This is really important because I don't want you just to be here to get information. I want you to be here to be transformed, to be a better, more loving, more whole person. So what was some of your takeaways from what Diana said? Yeah, some people are saying, I have to listen to it again. It was good. Yeah, and some of you are naming some of the physical issues that you have. Yeah, chest pains and gastrointestinal problems. Kelly's saying one of her takeaways was the importance of community and trust that's restored in a safe community. And we try to keep Conquer as safe as possible. We have all kinds of, you know... <clears throat> People might think of them who aren't in Conquer as hoops that you have to join, that go through. Like you have to say, you're here for yourself. You're not here for another person. You're here to do your own work. You're a female. You're not a male. All of the kind of things. We want to make sure you are who you say you are because we want to keep this as safe and protected as possible as community. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of you are really resonating with the physical stress. I need to love myself and take better care of me, right? Yeah. And God calls us. He assumes we love ourselves. Love one another as you love yourself. And he's not talking about a narcissistic, you know, it's all about me kind of self-love. He's talking about as you care for you, even husbands, love your wives as your own body, as you love. No one hates his own flesh, but cares for it, it says in Ephesians. So he's saying love others as you would love yourself. But when we don't love ourselves, when we hate ourselves, because we don't measure up to our unrealistic standard of perfection. Like I gotta be better than I am. I'm never enough, I'm never enough. How many of you suffer from not enough disease? Yeah, we all do. I'm not enough, I'm not enough. I'm not pretty enough, I'm not thin enough, I'm not spiritual enough, I'm not uh, smart enough, I'm not rich enough, I'm not humble enough. You know, <laughs> Whatever not enough is for you, it, there is somewhere where you don't measure up, right? And the truth is, you don't. So this is the lie. I have to be perfect in order to be enough. I have to measure up higher than everybody else. I have to be more beautiful and more smart and thinner than everybody and more organized and more. I have to be perfect in every area in order for me to feel good about myself. Wow. That's impossible. That's impossible. So, of course, that I'm always going to feel shame. I'm not enough. Do you see how our beliefs impact our emotional and mental health, even toward ourselves? So I'm going to invite a new guest, one of our Conquer women, Jennifer, to share her story. And Jennifer is currently living well. She's filed for divorce after 14 years. Um, but we're going to invite Jennifer to share her story. So Jennifer, welcome to the stage. Hi. Oops, turn on your mic. Uh, unmute yourself, Jennifer. Press the unmute button over by, you're in the, you've got those, but press your, uh, where it says unmute down there. We still can't hear you. On your computer, can you press unmute? 
You're talking through your microphone, but we're not, you're not, we're not hearing you. Yeah, I, I don't, I, I'm not technical. I can't help you, but we can't, we can't hear you. So can you hear me? You can hear me. You can hear me, but we can't hear you. Um, so I'm not sure what we can do. Can you turn on your, hmm. Jennifer, I'm going to put you back and I'm going to have tech help you. Okay. I'm going to do some, I think something else for a minute and I'm going to have just stay here and I'm going to have tech help you. Okay. So Martha, can you call Jennifer or somebody call Jennifer and help her get her microphone on? And I am going to answer some questions. If you have questions that you would like to ask, um, I'm going to answer some questions before we get to Jennifer. If you have questions about what we just talked about, I'm going to look here. So to be honest, I'm having a hard time seeing joy in my future. How can I add hope and happiness when I feel so shaken and sad all of the time? So you can add hope and happiness in your future self. You can say, I want my future self to be hopeful and happy. So here, so if you were lost, if you were in a map and you were lost and you say, here I am in sadness and depression land, but I want to go to hope and happiness land, right? So this is what we're doing in that exercise that we did at the beginning. So if I want to go out of sadness and depression land and I want to move to hope and happiness land, first of all, what would I need to do differently to start taking those next right steps forward, right? So it might be, hmm, I might need to get a good night's sleep because I'm more depressed, I notice, when I don't sleep well. I might need to stop watching so much social media about everybody's wonderful life because it just makes me mad that my life isn't so wonderful, right? So maybe I need to stop doing that. Maybe I need to go out in the sunshine every day and think of 10 things that are good about my life right now. So those would be the ways that you would start saying, here's where I am. I don't want to stay here. What am I doing now? that can help me get to where I want to go. So if I'm 10 pounds overweight here and I want to be 10 pounds less, what might I need to start doing now? Clean out all my chocolate candy, stop eating ice cream, maybe start taking a walk so that I am moving toward where I want to be. Does that make sense? So it's not that we can magically change our weight or our painting skills or our emotional life, right? But we can say, hmm, I don't like where I'm at. What steps am I doing to perpetuate where I'm at? So I'm not getting enough sleep. I'm watching bad social media. I'm listening to my husband yell at me all the time. I have no boundaries. What boundaries do I need? What do I need to do differently for my self-care so that I'm moving toward hope and happiness, right? Those would be the things you need to do. And... In addition to that, if you're clinically depressed, which means this uh, shaken and sad all the time, longer than two weeks in a row without a break, you may need to see a doctor to give you some help temporarily. So I'm not uh, saying medication fixes depression. It doesn't any more than Theraflu fixes the flu. But if you're in bed with the flu and you're vomiting and you can't get out of bed and you've got things to do like take care of your kids and you've got to do it, Theraflu helps because it minimizes some of the pain, right? It doesn't take away the problem. You still have the flu. So antidepressants don't take away depression. They help dull some of the feelings that you have so that you can function, which is a great help. If it's just like if I have a, a broken leg, if I have a crutch or I have a, a, a one of those wheelie scooters that you can have, that's a great help to get around because you got to get around. You got to function, but you don't want to be on that thing all the time, you wanna heal, right? You wanna heal. And so you wanna do the work to heal those feelings so that you can get to that place. And what are the steps that you need to do that? It might be you need some therapy. It might be you need to just exercise and walk and start thinking differently, to start renewing your mind with the truth. All those things can take you from here to there. It's not gonna be like this, just like I'm not gonna fix this painting by tonight, but it will help you to move forward toward those goals. Here's another question. I think Jennifer's back. So I'm going to answer this one question. Hopefully her mic is working. I feel so lonely. Like I feel like Conquer would be a good community, but I am afraid of opening myself up again and getting hurt. 
How can I get past this so I can try to find community? I think you have to decide where's a safe community. Uh, the, and, and there's no perfect community. Conquer has some hiccups sometimes and we deal with it. And life has hiccups. And part of what you need to learn is when I'm in a community that's relatively safe and is monitored for safety and, and all of that, when there's a hiccup, I can trust that it's taken care of, that I can take care of it, that people will help me take care of it, that that's not gonna be like before. I will be one of our values in our membership and in our whole company is that we want women to use their voice to be seen, heard, and valued. That doesn't mean you're always going to be agreed with. All right. So sometimes people might say on the Facebook page, hey, I don't, I'm not sure this is a good idea for you. Right? Can you handle that? Maybe you can't right now. So then you might not share some of your ideas if you are afraid of getting feedback but part of real relationship and real life, but we're not snarky, we're not critical. We're not saying you're going to hell if you decide that. We're not doing that. So we're trying to be real relationships, real honesty, real connection. And sometimes we don't agree with everybody and that's okay too. Can we love one another? Can we have a conversation with one another respectfully, even if we don't agree on every point? We don't have to, that's not real life. I don't agree with everything with even my own adult children. And we can still have conversations about that, right? Respectful, loving conversations and let them take care of their life and you take care of your life. You're not in charge of fixing their life and they're not in charge of fixing your life. So we may give opinions, but ultimately you're in charge of fixing your life. So I would encourage you to take a chance in a community that's pretty darn safe and pretty much understanding of what you're going through right now because everybody feels a little shy that way. So that's where I would say, this is a perfect community for you to practice on and try building those relationships. All right. Now we're going to go back to Jennifer and hopefully she's got her sound fixed. Hey, Jennifer. Hi. Can you hear me now? I can hear you perfectly. I'm so glad <laughs> that fixed. I don't know if it was the headphones or whatever, but I'm glad you're here. Yeah. I'm on my phone now. It was my computer for some reason. So okay. I figured it out. All right. Good, good. Thank you, tech team. I'm so glad that there are people who know how to do that. Yeah. And we're not all good at everything, right? right? So I'm not good at that. I'm not good at that. And I don't beat myself up for that. I, I accept that and pay us someone else to do it because we need it done. And so that's where the beauty of accepting your limitations, accepting what you're not good at can be really helpful. So Jennifer, tell us a little bit about your story. So um, I have been married for about 14 years. It's been um, destructive and abusive for that entire time, mostly uh, spiritual and emotional abuse um, with some financial abuse and physical abuse as well. Um, and I am currently in the process of divorce. Um, we've been separated for um, going on two years now. Can you describe a little bit of the spiritual abuse? Because I think that's where it gets really confusing. Yeah, it's very confusing. Um, and that's why Conquer is so helpful. Um, so uh, you talked about those um, four belief, false beliefs that we have. I had all of those plus like the extra package. <laughs> um, and so uh, some of them that were spoken over me kind of uh, almost daily were that like marriage is supposed to be hard. So anytime something was really hard, really, really awful. I was told marriage is supposed to be hard. It's a covenant, not a contract. Meaning that like, no matter what he was doing, I wasn't okay to like remove myself from offering full relationship to him at all times. Um, that marriage was supposed to make me holy and not happy. So that when I did feel unhappy, I internalized a lot of um, guilt and shame because of that, um, that God hates divorce. That was another false belief um, that amnesty equals forgiveness. And mm -hmm. so anytime there were these repeated patterns over and over, all he had to do was say, sorry. And if I ever brought it up again, I was keeping a record of wrongs and not forgiving him and being basically unchristian um, for wanting to deal with those patterns. Um, anytime I disagreed with him, I was told that it was disrespect and that I wasn't being respectful and I wasn't being submissive and even deeper. And I think probably the most damaging one 
kind of saved it for the end is that like um, anytime I disagreed with him or had a suggestion, um, I was told that I was uh, believing Satan's lies and that Satan was trying to sow like discord or get a foothold in our marriage um, and that he was attacking our unity and our oneness in Christ. And so I wasn't allowed to disagree without experiencing like intense doubt about my salvation and like who I belonged to. Wow. How did you ever crawl your way out of there? Because I assume you went to a church that fed those beliefs as well. Yeah. Um, when we first met, we went to a, a really great church. And so um, soon after getting married, he wanted to leave that church because it wasn't holy enough, I guess, for him. And um, the church we met at was, a, you know, they had women elders, women pastors and teachers, and it was great. And then all of a sudden that was not OK. Um, and so we went to churches that confirmed that we read lots of books and Bible studies and couples groups and things like that, that like, you know, the first book we read as a couple was Love and Respect um, by Egrix. And uh, we read John Piper, you know, This Momentary Marriage and things like that, that really reinforced and solidified um, those beliefs. And I felt so... Um, forgotten and forsaken by God. Mm -hmm. um, it, it felt like God, for some reason at the time, wanted me to suffer, like I deserved it and earned it. And he, you know, I tried to see maybe he's trying to grow me. And I really just kind of internalized all that and put it all on myself and tried to be the best Christian wife I could possibly be. And I started reading a lot of um, self-help and growth things. And I came across your book, um, uh, How to Act Right When Your Husband Acts Wrong and the Emotionally Destructive Marriage. And that kind of started um, just kind of peeking open the door out of that darkness um, and seeing the, the destructive and how, how those scriptures were being twisted. Um, and then soon after, joined a coaching group and heard a lot of truth. <laughs> Um, and then joined Conquer after mm -hmm. that. And so as you began to get healthier, and at least internally, what began to happen in your marriage? Um, I began to um, become more confident in God's truth, and that those verses had been twisted and taken out of context. And so I became much harder to control. Um, you talked about compliance. Um, that was required. And if there was not compliance, basically we all had hell to pay. Um, and it got scary sometimes. And so um, I realized that in placating him and trying to get him to calm down, I was actually enabling this behavior. And my kids who were, you know, crying and hiding in their bedroom, they were having the appropriate response. Me trying to calm him down and please him to get him to calm down was actually the, that's an inappropriate and unhealthy response. And that was enabling the behavior. Mm -hmm. And so um, I started to see how my dance steps needed to change um, and how I could be empathetic to what was happening without continuing to enable. I started to deal with like my codependency and my people pleasing and, um, and just grow more confident in my understanding of God's word and, and his call on my life to be God centered and not husband centered. Mm -hmm. And so as you began to, you didn't turn into someone mean, you didn't turn into someone snarky. You just stood your ground as a daughter of God in your identity as one that doesn't <clears throat> deserve to be treated that way, controlled, condemned, managed, um, took responsibility for yourself. How did he respond to that? Not well. Yeah. <laughs> um, I imagine. So, <laughs> yeah. So one small example, um, for years I would give him, he, he takes a weekly medication and I would have to administer it via an injection. And I would also give him haircuts, like do, buzz his hair for him. And for years, he would just tell me it's time for my medicine or I need a haircut now. And I had asked him many, many times, could you please just ask me nicely? Um, I don't like being talked to like that. 
And um, so he continued to do that. And this was while I was in the coaching group. So I got a lot of support <laughs> during this time and lots of validation and encouragement. Um, and so the next time I knew it was coming up, it was the weekend for it. And he did it again. And I said, um, I'm happy to make a phone call for you and, and schedule a haircut appointment, but I will no longer be doing that because um, I'm not okay being talked to and treated that way. And he lost it. <laughs> um, he got very physically scary um, and violent and um, shouting, but I had already had a safety plan um, because of Conquer and we had bags and we left the house and um, I told him that I was no longer okay being talked to that way, that if that ever happened again, we would leave every single time. And um, so that was my first big boundary um, with him. Okay. Yeah. And so I assume you had to leave again. Yeah, we did. Um, it happened a second time. And, um, and shortly after that, um, and, and this was over me just not wanting to give him a kiss because he had disrespected me earlier in the day. I didn't feel like kissing him. And so I said, no, thank you. And I said, but I do want to talk about what happened. And he got very, very angry and physical again. And so we left. And that's when I decided that separation was probably going to be the best if we were going to try to make the marriage work mm -hmm. um, and find healing. And so during the course of separating um, and just gaining more clarity and, and being able to recognize um, how destructive it was as the separation kind of went on, um, and seeing, um, you're so good at teaching the difference, like between what repentance versus unrepentance looks like, um, and just gaining a lot of clarity with that, um, being able to make choices for my safety and my sanity and, um, and realizing that it's probably not going to go in a good direction. And so all these steps that you had taken prior to this, I just want the women to understand this. It's like the painting. There's a messy middle. Like, you, I don't know what he's going to do. I don't know how that you're doing your next right steps of getting healthier, stronger, really connecting to the love of God for you and developing a respectful self-care. Like I'm not letting myself be treated this way anymore. And that's okay. It's not okay for him. It's not only not okay for me to be treated that way. It's not okay for him to treat me that way. It dishonors him to act like a bully, let alone it dishonors yeah. me. And so as you were hoping and attempting to be a helpmate, not only by protecting yourself, but by speaking into him, he wasn't having any of that. Correct. Yeah. Um, and that, goes along with a pattern of spiritual abuse in the relationship. Um, anytime I made a suggestion or um, took the lead on anything, I was accused of like usurping his authority. Um, so I knew that nothing coming from me was going to be accepted. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So how then how have your children handled it? I think that's the question all of our <laughs> listeners are probably going to wonder because they're the, the belief again is my children, my children, they're going to be worse. They're going to suffer. This is going to be terrible if they have to go to his house and all of those kind of things. So answer that question, Jennifer. Yeah, it was rough in the beginning. Um, they were completely unprepared to spend time with him without me there as a buffer and kind of deflecting and taking a lot of that. And, um, and so we've had to learn boundaries for them. We've had to do a lot of work with that. So everything I've learned in Conquer has been something that I've made age appropriate to teach them as well. That they are worthy of love and care, that they are valuable, that um, if something isn't good or healthy for them, they have a right to say so and make choices that are good for them. Um, especially that they don't have to show up to every argument they're invited to. Mm. Um, <laughs> he's a spiritual bully and he will bust out the Bible and try to tell them that they're sinning against God if they laugh at a part. And so, um, you know, they've had to grow in their spiritual maturity, um, and their confidence as well. And over the separation, they've just done so well and I'm so proud of them. And we've learned emotional regulation skills. So their stress levels have gone down significantly. Um, they're just such happy, joyful, peaceful kids now. Um, yes, they spend time with him and yes, they get dysregulated and upset and we have to 
deal with that um, when they come back home. Um, but our, my home, the home I've created is peaceful and loving. I love that. And I think I couldn't just love what you said more when, when you talked about your kids need one healthy parent and you've done your work. So your children are seeing a huge difference in your house and the environment that you've created. That's the future for some of you that you want to create. You did it. You created this environment of peace and safety and conversations about what doesn't feel good and how to have boundaries and all the things that every human child needs to learn in order to grow up to be a healthy adult. And had you not done your work, then your husband would have been the spiritual bully and you would have been the passive accommodator. Imagine the impact on your children and their view of marriage, of themselves, of women, of men, of life, of God would have all been distorted. Yeah. And um, that's huge. And I really wanted them to know how um, strong God created them to be as women. And that was not allowed when we were together. Um, you know, he didn't want them to pursue careers. He just wanted them to get married and be stay at home homeschool moms. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just saw how limited um, staying made that for them. Um, mm -hmm. And so now that we're out from that constant oppression, yes, they still spend time with him. Um, but that's not their home base. Yeah, that's so good. So you've been in Conquer, and that's been a big place for you to get feedback, get support, um, f get information, all the video library. Have you accessed the library much? Yeah, a ton. <laughs> um, I love it. And um, I still go back to it. I still go back to the Conquer journey, especially um, the confidence step. Um, because of the severe like psychological and spiritual abuse, um, I'm still working. It's going to be a lifelong journey for me to um, keep trusting God and keep trusting myself and building that confidence and, um, you know, not hearing his voice, but hearing my voice and God's voice. Um, and so I consistently go back to the videos. Yeah. Well, Jennifer, I am just delighted that you're, you've are you been willing to share with our audience. I'm sure people are curious about all the instruments on your wall. Are you a musician? Oh, no, but my children are. They're very good. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. So it's just pretty on the background, but I just wondered. I'm curious. So thank you so much. Is there anything else that you'd like to share before I let you go? Um, I think I just want to um, encourage the women that um, we say it all the time. All the coaches say it. You say it. Do your own work. Um, that worry less about what he's doing and why he's doing it and worry more about what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, and that was that moment. I made that switch from being a, a dysfunction detective to being like a me detective, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, made all the difference. And I really started to grow at that point. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that phrase, dysfunction detective. We're, we're really good at that. And we can yeah. search the internet and we can figure out, oh, he's a covert narcissist. Now I know. And that doesn't help you one bit. Right. <laughs> you exactly. So thanks so much. I really appreciate you being here. Thanks, Leslie. All right. God bless. Bye-bye. Bye. Wow. Her story was powerful, ladies, wasn't it? This, is, this, is, this could be you. This could be you in a year. This could be you in two years. Is this what you want? Do you want this for yourself? Do you want this growth and this healing? Do you want this sense of, I'm going to work on me because that's the only person I can control. And her husband wasn't going to change. He had very strong beliefs entitled. I'm, it, I'm entitled by God to do this. That's, those are pretty hard beliefs to change. But her beliefs changed because she was believing it too. And she no longer believes that anymore. So what was your takeaway from what Jennifer shared? Put it in the chat. What was your aha moment for yourself, for your life? And maybe you're not comfortable putting it in the chat because I get it, this is my public, but write it down for yourself, okay? Write it down in your journal. Wow, today I learned God that maybe what my husband is teaching or maybe even what my pastor is teaching isn't the way you see me that you don't just see me as a, a wife, a role. 
you do your wifely duties, wife. That's sort of the mindset. Just talking to a woman yesterday who was involved in the Bill Gothard movement and she was one of his little girls that he groomed. And it's so hard to break free from this mindset of you're just there to serve them. That's all a woman is. But Jesus saw women as people. He didn't see them as objects for his sexual pleasure or for his service. He saw them as people, as real people. The woman at the well, the woman with the issue of blood, the woman who poured expensive perfume on his feet, Mary and Martha who had conversations with him. He didn't use them. He saw them. He loved them. They were his daughters, his image bearers as well. So just want you to ponder that and play with that a bit and see your value. All right. I'm going to add uh, one of our coaches, Susan. She's here. Hi, Susan. So good to see you. Hi, Leslie. So good to see you. Thanks for uh, having me here. You're so welcome. Susan is one of our newer coaches, not so new anymore. You've been here for a few years, but one of our newer ones and yes. she's from Michigan. And Susan has been, oh, I've known Susan for a long time. And she's just, you've, if you've been reading the blog, we've gotten lots of great feedback on Susan's writing. She's just a thoughtful, introspective, wise woman who is so good at pausing. You're just so good, Susan, at just pausing. I'm like, and you're just so good at <laughs> pausing and noticing what's going on, what's going on in here, what's going on out there, and to catch yourself sooner rather than later. I tend to kind of reflect back, and you're kind of catching before, and that's such a wonderful quality about you. Um, I love that about you. And so, um, and also you yourself was in a destructive marriage and had to mm -hmm. learn as a therapist, as a woman, as a Christian, that it can happen to anybody. And mm -hmm. so what do you love most about our ministry? Well, Leslie, I am so thankful for you for starting this ministry. Um, and I learned so much from you. <laughs> yeah, I may be um, good at the pause, but you are good at so many things that I'm learning and, and absorbing from you as well. And one of those things is how you took your pain from childhood and created this ministry, right? You healed yourself enough to listen to God and create this ministry so that other women could heal. And I just so admire that. And it, it was so meaningful to me as well um, to hear your voice. Um, I felt like God was saying some really important things. And then to come in and read your book and hear you talking about scripture, it really aligned with what God was telling me. And that gave me clarity and confidence because those weren't things that I was hearing in counseling, in church, in my circle. And so I feel like that just helped me to stabilize and to get strong to do the things that I needed to do. So I did end up divorcing after a 24 year marriage. Um, and it took me a while to get there and to then build myself up out of that. I hadn't worked for 17 years of that time raising kids. And so it was scary. And so I'm so thankful for you and your ministry and all you've taught me. Thank you. And here's another example. Susan was somewhere and she's not there anymore. And so we did this exercise at the beginning. Where are you here and where would you like to be? Mm -hmm. and, and Susan had to do some catching up or some retooling as you weren't in the job market for 17 years. And that was scary. And you, you've done a beautiful job. And, and what does that feel like for you to know that God was with you and in you and for you through this journey? Incredible. I could have never imagined where I would be today, right? There were some really scary moments of me thinking, how in the world could I be a Christian marriage and family therapist who's divorced? <laughs> it didn't seem possible to me. Um, and I'm doing it. And I see the fruit um, from God and he carried me and sustained me and helped me get to where I am. And now coaching 
women who are in destructive relationships, I feel like he's allowed my pain also to be part of who I am and helping others heal. Mm-hmm. And I love, Leslie, that this is changing generations. Mm-hmm. I caught Jennifer saying, oh, I'm teaching this to my kids. Mm-hmm. I love that. I love so- that. too. This is Amanda. She's bringing my coffee. <laughs> Thank you, Amanda. Appreciate it. I said, someone's got to bring me some coffee because I'm going to get I I love that too. And it just is so, it just so blesses my heart because I had choices to make and in my, in back in my childhood, you know, that I was so fixated, even as I became a therapist, and I'm sure you felt this way too, as a marriage and family therapist, I can fix him. I know what's wrong with him. (laughs) I can fix my mother. I know what's wrong with her. If only she would listen to me and she wouldn't, you know, She, she never did listen to me. She never did care anything about what I had to say about her life. And for me to begin to switch and say, but what's wrong with my life? I'm so angry and frustrated Mm. and so mad that she won't let me fix her and she won't let me advise her and she won't let me change her. And she wouldn't. And, and I had so much to deal with, with that. And so I'm appreciative that you, you have noticed that God did switch my direction and, and helped me to realize that. And one of the things that we've talked about Susan before, and I'd love you to talk about this is I think it's really important for Christian women. Like I'm not theologically trained. And so the things that I've learned from the Bible are things that God has taught me, things that I've you know, prayed about and the Holy Spirit. Not, I didn't go to the, you know, theology school or graduate from a seminary or anything like that. And so how important it is as a coach and at, on our team, and also just as a person who went through this to learn as a woman to think and to think mm-hmm. for yourself. It's crucial. And I love that you keep bringing that up time and time again. I hear you telling women, don't take me at my word, investigate for yourself. And I think that's so important. We do need to know God. We need to have the relationship with God. And he does speak into our lives and bring clarity if we seek him. We can't just be out there reading commentary and um, listening to everything that we hear will be confused otherwise as we have to do our own work and knowing the heart of God and experiencing the heart of God in our own lives for ourselves. Yeah. And so when we, I was just thinking back to the conversation that we just had with Jennifer and when you know the heart of God, her husband displayed nothing of the heart of God. He Mm -hmm. had biblical rules behind what he was thinking was right and good But it was so harsh and so legalistic and so oppressive. It was nothing like Jesus talked to anybody other than the Pharisees. And yet there are people who believe that that is biblical. And so I think this is so important that women begin to understand the heart of God. How did you Mm -hmm. come to really experience that for yourself, Susan, and, and know that you could get through this I you know, imagine that you felt shame. Here I am, marriage, marriage and family therapist, divorce. You said, I can't, I can't do that. And yet you can't. You can't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. A, a lot of shame. So I was raised in a Christian family. And so I've been a believer most of my life. But I think it was really through the struggles of uh, asking God, what is real love? What does that really look like? And um, working with God on that and just allowing him to love me and uh, attempting to love others in that agape way, uh, unconditional way. Um, And he just really took me through scriptures. I've moved a lot in my life and um, in my married life, we moved constantly. And I found um, solace in finding Christian women who I could study the word with. Mm -hmm. And that was the backbone is reaching out to find a community of Christian women and really diving in together about what is scripture saying. Yeah, and you do such a beautiful job of that on the blog as well. Because I think, you know, when I started this ministry, I was working as a counselor and, and I was actually writing my book on depression. Many of you may not know the story of how I really got oriented toward working with women in destructive marriages. Um, because I was working with children because that's what, what I was a child who was abused. I was going to work with mm-hmm. children and I didn't like working with children professionally. <laughs> so that, that wasn't my thing, but, but I cared about child abuse. And so then when I'm writing this book on depression and I'm seeing woman after woman, after woman, after woman, clinically depressed, 
because they're living in a destructive marriage. And I'm thinking, mm -hmm. why are we not teaching them to say no, to think for themselves? Why are they, they're just shutting down because they have no voice and no choice. And now they're getting sicker and sicker mentally because they can't be themselves. They have to be just yeah. a robot. And I thought, oh God, who's talking about this? And I'm looking and looking and looking and can't find anything about that. I wrote my book, How to Act Right When Your Spouse Acts Wrong. And I right at the beginning, I said, hey, if you're in a destructive marriage, what looks right for one woman does not look right for another woman. But then I thought, God, you're calling me to, to talk about this. And that was the beginning of it. And I think seeing so many women sick and depressed who were in these kind of marriages just broke my heart and it breaks the heart of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And so I love that you are seeing women. Um, I love that quote in the Bible. I, I had the opportunity to meet Sheila Gregoire this week. Um, and she spoke about the um, passage in Luke 7, 44, where Jesus asked the disciples, do you see this woman? Right. He points her out and causes them to pause, uh, pause and take notice of her. Of course, they knew she was busy in the room, but to really look at her and see that she's important. And I really feel like you do that for mm -hmm. women. And it's so needed um, in this world as women are important. They're not just to serve somebody else. They're not just there to support somebody else's purpose. But we as women have a purpose of our own. Mm -hmm. And you really invest in that. Yes, I do. And I think it's so important that that's why when we think we don't matter and we're not important, we are. God made you as a co-heir. You're mm -hmm. not just the, the servant of the heir. You're the co-heir. And we're not acting like it. And I'm not saying act like a big shot. Act like a, a daughter of the king. You see, we can't act like an orphan and a child of the king at the same time. We live in one reality or the other, depending on our belief system. So what are some of the changes that you've seen or the women's growth as a result? Mm -hmm. Susan, as you've been working in our program for a while now, what, what are some of the outcomes you see happening that excite you? Um, I'm really excited when the outcome shifts to what's going on in the marriage to what's going on within me, right? So the women in particular, when they start to really do their own work, I love that uh, Jennifer said, what, what, what did she call it? Dysfunction detective. They, yes, they move from that. Oh. I hadn't heard that before. And I love that phrase. They move from looking at what is his problem and helping him solve his problem and investing in his problem to doing their own work. Like she said, um, that seems to change everything, right? Once you make that switch and start doing your own work, ladies, um, that's when um, things tend to shift and women get healthy, they get stronger, uh, the light comes back in their eyes, they find purpose, they meet God in their circumstances in a whole new way. And I feel like through this ministry, they're being seen and heard and known in a way that just brings light in life that is astounding. And we saw just that in Jennifer's life, and we saw the impact, the change in her is having on her daughters. Mm -hmm. That's what we want to see. We don't want to see the sins of the father being passed to the third and fourth generation because of the passivity of the mother, because of the fear of the mother. That, ladies, if this is you, this is your, this is God is, you're here because God wants you to be here. You, you got other things to do, I'm sure. You are here. Mm -hmm. God wants you to be here and he wants you to hear that maybe it's time for you to work on you, that you have done all the things. Like Lisa said, she has a very clear conscience that she did all she could possibly do yeah. to save her marriage, but she was drowning. She couldn't save her marriage because she couldn't just do it by herself. She needed a partner who wanted to save her marriage too. Mm -hmm. And so she had to save herself. She had to work on herself. And she did. And aren't we glad that she did? And aren't we glad that Jennifer did? And I'm sure Jennifer's daughters are glad that she did. What about you? What are you doing? Susan, is there anything else that you want to share with the women as you're observing, you know, deep, deep changes in a lot of women's mm -hmm. lives that just to encourage women to not be afraid to take that first next right step? 
Mm. Well, you mentioned Lisa Turkers, and I love that um, phrase she said, I was giving up the best of who I was to support the worst of who he was, to encourage the worst of who he was, and to really look at that. And I felt that true for my story as well, is are you losing yourself? What is your body telling you? Are you starting to dis disconnect from yourself, from your emotions, your body, from God? Um, that's kind of that danger zone when you know you need to make a change. And I believe conquer is that great place to come to when you need to make that change and find out who you are and get strong again and find your own purpose. Yeah, yeah. Find yourself, find your purpose that God, you know, I don't have a seed packet here, but sometimes I'll take my seed packets and I'll just rip it open and say, imagine like that they go before the Lord and say, see, I'm nice and safe in my packet. <laughs> like I never, mm -hmm. I never grew. I never mm -hmm. went. And God's saying, this isn't who you're supposed to be. This is the start. This isn't the end. They, that you have one precious life to steward. And if someone is squashing your seed or like Jennifer, I think was very threatened by her seed. I mean, look what an amazing, strong woman she is. And mm -hmm. he, didn't like he didn't want her to have an opinion. He didn't want her to have a voice. He didn't want her to have a talent. He didn't want her to do anything other than what he wanted her to do. And he was entitled to treat her however he wanted. Because when you're an object, if I want to kick my shoes, I can kick my shoes. If I want to throw my cell phone on the ground, I can throw my cell phone on the ground. It's not going to say, ouch, it's not going to have any boundaries. And that's what he wanted. But that's not who she is. So mm -hmm. thanks so much, Susan, for sharing and sharing your story and sharing your heart. I appreciate you. And I appreciate you being a part of our team so much. Thanks so much. Thank you, Leslie. All right. Bye-bye. All right. <clears throat> How was that for you? What was your takeaway from Susan? Susan's a wise, wise coach. What was your takeaway from her? For you, for you, what did God say to you? And again, feel free to write in the chat, but also recognize this is a public chat. So don't write anything that would cause you to be harmed in some way if someone read it. But you need to know, what is God saying to you? The Holy Spirit is here and he's in you. If you're a believer, he's in you. And he has that still small voice. And he tells us stuff. And sometimes he tells us stuff that we don't, we don't want to hear because it scares the bejeebies or it makes us afraid. I remember one time God told me I was not handling myself and my best self. This was a number of years ago when I lived in Pennsylvania. And I was on the phone with someone and she was treating me very disrespectfully. She was yelling at me and accusing me of something that wasn't true. And I just said, done. And I hung up. <laughs> <laughs> not my best self. And the Lord said to me, the Holy Spirit right then in that moment said to me, Leslie, call her back and apologize. Now that would not have come out of my brain. I would have had nothing in me that wanted to do that. So I knew it was God because I didn't want to do it. And yet it was something so outside my natural inclination to do. I felt totally justified hanging up on her. He said, I said, but what about her? He goes, I'll deal with her. I'm dealing with you, right? So your husband is being dealt with by the Holy Spirit too. Whether or not he's listening, you have no control over. But what is he saying to you? So was I going to make that phone call and say, you know what? I don't like the way I handled that last moment. I was really upset by what you said. And instead of talking to you about it, I hung up. So I did my part. Now the other person still didn't do their part. So we couldn't restore our relationship. But I had a clean conscience that I did as much as it depends on you, Romans 12 says, be at peace. I did my part. And so I listened to what God said. Did it turn out well? No. So why do it? I did it for me to take the next right step of obedience. What do you need to do for you? Whether he's going to like it or not, you don't know. What do you need to do for you? What is God saying to you? All right, I'm going to take a couple more minutes here and answer some more questions. We have a bunch of questions on the chat. I'm going to pull my glasses on because it's small type. Hold on.
I'm in the starting stages of separation. Is Conquer good for me or only for women trying to stay married? You heard Jennifer's story. She separated while in Conquer and a lot of women make that decision because they've been staying too long and they realize that. So they are developing a safety plan so that they can separate. And so sometimes that is what they do in Conquer or some women have already separated and they join Conquer because they need the support of other women who know what their life is like. <clears throat> When I first joined Conquer in um, October 21, I was such an emotional mess that I never went through the first steps of the Conquer journey with new sisters. If I renew my membership, may I go through these steps now and be able to join the new Conquer journey? Absolutely, absolutely. So if you've if you've been a member of Conquer for a while and you never did the Conquer journey because of whatever life gets in the way, or you join new, you are welcome to the new group and you can go to the Conquer journey now. And that's such an important part. We didn't always have the Conquer journey. So when I told you we started with 40 people and it was just me and they would say, oh, yeah, teach us how to set boundaries. So I do a video on boundaries and then teach us how to do this. Help with tell, What about self-esteem? I do, you know, so I would do these little videos for them so that I could teach them and they would go in this library. So there was only one video a month and that was fine for a year. You know, they'd watch the video, we'd talk about it. That was the next one. Well now Conquer has, and we did two videos a month back then. So we have over a hundred videos in that library and it can be overwhelming when you join Conquer and say, well, it's like going in the library. Where do I start? I don't know. And so let me just tell you that we structured this then once we realized it got confusing for newbies, we structure you with exactly where we want you to go for the first six weeks and you can go wherever you want. But the first six weeks, we think these are the highlights of what you need to start knowing. And like Jennifer said, she's going back to the confidence module because, of course, you're not going to learn everything you need to know in every single step. But you're going to get the outline of where if you want to get healthy, this is this is the roadmap, girls. These are the steps. You might have to dig deep on some of those steps and do a work for six months on one of those steps. So safety module, if you're not safe, you might have to take a couple of months to just work on that one before you move to the next one. It's okay, but at least there's a, a roadmap for you to take and there's weekly coaching calls. So you watch the video, you get on a Zoom call with everybody else who's new and you ask your questions and figure out, okay, well, how do I put this into practice for my situation, right? You get that help doing it, not just learning about it, but actually implementing it so that you're doing well. And if this is your, you've been in Conquer before and we didn't have those steps or you were in it, but you just didn't do it and you're joining again, absolutely, you start as a new member. Okay. I fear my kids will continue the patterns that their father is showing them. Will Conquer help me be a parent that can help them see through the flattery? I hate the idea. That they may think this is normal marriage behavior. I think you saw from Jennifer's story and Susan didn't tell a story about her kids, but they see it too. I think once one parent starts modeling healthy behavior um, and is it better to do it later when they're older? Probably not. It's better to do it earlier when they're younger. Because the more that your kids are teenagers, they've developed their own bad habits and they've developed their own belief systems and they're less interested in hearing from you as a parent. They're often doing their teenage stuff and they don't really want to hear from you anymore. So the younger your children are, the more you can work on getting healthy, do it for their benefit and yours, even if it doesn't fix your marriage. And for those of you who are older and you're saying, oh my gosh, my kids are messed up. They've married the wrong person. They're in an abusive relationship too. I was, you know, the good wife. I was the passive accommodator. I did everything that Jennifer did and some more. And now my kids are grown. It's too late. And I would say it's not too late. However, you are going to have to do some amends making. And we teach how to do that in Conquer. So I'll just give you a real brief outline of this. So amends means that you confess to your children the mistakes that you made. Instead of blaming their dad anymore, you're gonna confess your mistakes. And plan for this, don't just do it at the top of your head. So we talk about how to do that, but so I will give you a pretend script, okay? So you would say to your adult children, hey, I'd really love to have a conversation with you about some things I'm learning about myself and I have some apologies to make, especially with you know kids who are, are you interested in, in sitting down and talking with me about that? They say no, let it go. Right. So you're going to always just put your toe in the water first. They say yes. <clears throat> and then say, you know, when you were growing up, we went to a very conservative church that, uh, you know, it's kind of a Bill Gothard style. We're reading, you know, in the in Netflix, maybe you watched it, Shiny Happy People. It was kind of like that kind of church, maybe however you want to say it, where, you know, men were the head and women were the servants. And we didn't really have a voice or a choice. Our goal, a role was to be the good wife and submit and accommodate and do whatever the dad wanted. 
And that might work okay if you've got a good man. You know what our house was like. And I have come to regret that I wasn't strong enough or healthy enough myself <clears throat> to speak up and stand up and do something different. I'm so sorry that I let your dad hit you or talk to you that way. You didn't deserve it. That's not good parenting. And I was too scared of what might happen that he'd throw us out in the street. I didn't have a job and I didn't even know what to do to get a job. I was just frozen in fear. And I believe if you can do that, your kids can begin to see a new healthier person and you can begin to have a healthier relationship of honesty and transparency and trust. I remember a woman in my counseling practice did that with her daughter. She said, um, I was so unhealthy, I allowed your stepfather to sexually abuse you. I knew it was happening and I couldn't do anything. I mean, it was a horrible thing she allowed. And the fact that she owned that and admitted that to her daughter, her daughter sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. She goes, I knew you knew and I didn't understand why you didn't help me, right? She knew, but now it's in the open. They could talk about it. And she said, I will pay, I can't fix you. I can't do your work. I know there's damage there. I will pay for your therapy. I want to make amends. And so I ended up seeing the daughter and, and but it was a beautiful thing. It's never too late to learn to get healthy and begin to model healthy behavior for your children and invite them to get healthy too. Now that daughter might've just been angry and rejected her mother. We didn't know the outcome of the story. That's the hard part is that you take the right step with your husband or you take the right step with your adult children, you don't know their hearts. You can't control their hearts. Lisa did all the right things and her husband didn't respond well. But you end up having a clear conscience that you've done all you can do to bring healing and restoration, right? As much as it depends on you. But do it in God's way, not in the typical female, passive, people-pleasing, accommodating way. That's not peace. That's just compliance and accommodation to a bully. That's not biblical honoring yourself or them. Now, sometimes we have to comply because we have a gun to our head. And if someone has a gun to my head, I'm going to comply too. But don't think it's good or right or biblical or healthy. It's just something you have to do. And so if you're in those situations, come to conquer, try it out, give yourself a gift, work on you, get your focus off of him, get your focus on you. All right. I think I'm going to go back. I'm going to look at my schedule. I want to make sure we stay on time. And so we have another guest in a minute. Let me answer one more question. I think I have a couple more minutes for her. Let me answer one more question. <clears throat> Would you recommend in-person counseling to help heal or start with a conquer? I was told by my trusted pastor that I should view my husband as my mission field and to stay the course. So that makes me nervous. How do I tell my pastor that I am not responsible for my husband's actions? I think that's a good phrase. Okay. Your husband is not your mission field. Okay. It's, you are not his Holy Spirit. You, he is not your mission field. That is not the purpose of marriage. Now, you can, just like he influences you, for good and bad, you can influence him by you getting strong and you getting healthy and by you speaking the truth in love and inviting him to healthy change. I think Jennifer showed us a good example of that. Hey, I'm not going to let myself be treated like this anymore. For some men, that could be a gigantic wake up call. Like, wow, I never knew it bothered you. Why didn't you ever tell me before? Because I thought I was supposed to just submit to it, right? Why didn't you ever tell him? My dad always talked to my mom that way. That Maybe that's an opportunity for him to get a wake-up call and say, I didn't know that bothered you. I didn't even know it was harsh. I mean, some people don't know. That's how they grew up. That's what their family did, and it seems normal. But if you don't ever say, ouch, stop, don't, I don't like that. That's not okay for me. Maybe your dad did it to your mom, but I don't like it. Don't do it to me. And if he doesn't respect your no, then that tells you something. But if you never say no to begin with, start there. Start there. So your husband is not your mission field. Can you be an influence on him? Yes. But the Bible periodically and regularly says that bad people and bad influences are more powerful than good influences. So, for example, in Proverbs it says, do not hang out with angry people. 
because you will learn to be like them and endanger your soul. Doesn't say, you know, they will learn to be peaceful if you're peaceful. You will learn to be like them. So usually it says, don't hang out with evildoers. Don't be around liars. Don't be around the foul mouth. Don't, and you know that. We know that if you're just working with people who are foul mouthed, it's just much easier for you to become foul mouth. And even if it never comes out your mouth, you're thinking it because they're, you're hearing it all the time. So we are easily impacted and influenced by other people. And so you are not responsible for your husband's spiritual life. You are responsible to be his helpmate. What does that look like biblically? It means not enabling him to destroy himself and others. That means that doesn't mean you can prevent it. It means that you speak into it and you don't cooperate with it. Do not, Ephesians says, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness. We participate by being compliant. Our silence is a compliance. For example, literature on bullying, not marital bullying, but just school bullying. You know the most important person in the bully triad? You've got the bully, you've got the bullied, and then you've got the bystander. The most important person in that triad is the bystander. Because the bystander who says nothing is actually supporting the bully. So if you are just accommodating the bully and you are passive and silent and submissive, your children believe you support that kind of behavior. You don't. And so for you to have the courage to not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness and yet speak the truth in love, hey, these would be two different ways of saying it. One is if you think he does actually love his children and wants to be a good dad, if you really believe that. And there might be dads who do that, but just don't control themselves very well. Say, hey, I believe with all my heart, you love our kids and you want to be a good dad. But the way you treated them five minutes ago or an hour ago or last night is not okay. It's disrespectful. It's demeaning. It's hurtful. It's abusive. And I will not be silent about that anymore. So I'm telling you because I love you and I believe you love our kids. That is like hitting them over the head with a hammer. And it's not proper parenting. That's a helpmate. And if your husband is a wise man, he will say, wow, my dad did it to me and it didn't bother me. And I'd say, it did bother you. It did bother you. It would bother anybody to be treated that way. And I'm not going to let my kids be treated that way. All right. So that's assuming he loves his kids. If you don't think he cares about his kids, and he's just a boy to say, God has given me our children, not just you, but me as a parent to steward our kids, safety, sanity, well-being. And I can't stand by and watch you treat him that, that way anymore, hitting them or slapping them or calling them names. I can't stand silently by. So I'm giving you a heads up. I know you hate when I interfere with your parenting. But if you ever do that again, I will interfere with your parenting out loud. So that our kids know that I don't agree with what you're doing. So he's going to decide whether he wants to be publicly called out by that in front of his kids. And again, this is the against all the Christian teaching that, oh, you've got to stand with your husband. Not if he's being abusive, you don't. And you shouldn't. If, you're, if your husband was mistouching your daughter, would you just stand by and say, well, I've got to support him? No, you wouldn't. I hope you wouldn't. So this is where you need to get some strength and confidence and courage, right? Just like Jennifer told us. She had to learn how to do that. And you may need this. You will need. It's not may. You can't do this by yourself. You need the support of other people and wise others who can help you. So let me move to our next guest. I'm going to switch my notes here and invite Kim on the screen. Hey, Kim. Hi there. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. <clears throat> Kim is a member of our Conquer membership. And Kim, long, how long have you been in Conquer? I joined in late 2018. Okay, so you've been in for a while. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think, oh, I'll just do the six-week Conquer <laughs> journey and I'll be done. <laughs> what would you have to say to them about that? Don't we wish. <laughs> yeah, right. Yes, don't we wish. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us a little bit about your story. 
<clears throat> so I, uh, I joined Conquer in 2018 at the time. Um, I started to divorce in 2018 out of pure panic. I had, I had a four year marriage and <clears throat> my marriage was full of a lot of confusion, like a lot of women talk about. And um, I mean, really for the vast majority of my marriage, my husband was also um, a lot of infidelity, a lot of infidelity, it was including porn, um, <clears throat> a lot of flirting behavior. I did not find out until we had been married for 30 years that it had been uh, entire, the entire marriage was, he'd been having anonymous sex with people he met in different places. And so that began a journey for us where he was getting help for sex addiction and I thought he was healing and it, it kind of looked like all the right things. Um, so that was in 2011, but one by one, all of his accountability started to fall off and um, all of his old behaviors came back. <clears throat> and then in 2018, it just became apparent that I was not doing well emotionally at all. Um, I could not function in the house with him the way his behavior was mm -hmm. and filed for divorce in 2018. And then start like a lot of other women trying to search online and figure out what the heck's going on with my husband thinking I'll help him. Um, I was a part of a church where the women's job was to support the family and keep the family intact. So I did that. And I did it well <laughs> because I made it for 40 years in the marriage. But, but anyway, I, having done the research online, trying to figure out what was going on, I found, found your book, Leslie. And that was, mm -hmm. that was my first, first hint that I was in an abusive marriage. Mm -hmm. I always thought abuse meant a black eye. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't know there was such a thing uh, as, as emotional abuse. And if, so as I started reading your book and underlining, I was, it was just an eye opener for me to realize what I had been living under for such a long time mm -hmm. and answered a lot of questions that, again, the confusion in, in my marriage is like, that's what that was. When he would say that to me, that's what that was. And I just did not understand it. But I began the journey of understanding it. Mm -hmm. And so... How did Conquer begin to help you? Well, first it gave a name to what I was experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, having it, words for having words for that is really helpful. Big, big you, time. Yeah. And it also helped me to understand I'm not imagining this. Mm -hmm. uh, this is this is a real thing. All these question marks I've had in my marriage. It's a valid thing for me to be asking these questions, even though I wasn't getting the answers I wanted from my husband. Um, but I, I was, I was like, okay, that's the Lord in me that's been speaking to me truth, but I had ignored it for such a long time um, mm -hmm. in my marriage. And again, thinking it was my job to keep my family intact and thinking divorce was wrong. Um, you know, growing up, I remember even hearing, <clears throat> even if he hits you. You can't leave. Right. So when we're in these churches that teach us that divorce is wrong, we think we're in it for the long haul and we do all that we can to train and uh, keep it together. But Conquer gave me, a, you know, first of all, gave me clarity and helped me to name it. And then it started teaching me what boundaries was about. I, I didn't understand the concept of boundaries. Mm -hmm. And, and then also under, that I didn't have to fix him, um, that it was no longer my job to fix him. And so um, tried to stay in the marriage for another year and a half and finally filed and we divorced in 2020. But man, it was a painful road. And, and I think for myself, um, the fear of the pain that you know is going to happen if you choose to leave the marriage, man, that's tough to overcome. Yeah. Um, it's sometimes easier to live in the fear you know than the fear you don't yes. know. Yeah, the pain oh, yeah. that you know than the pain that you don't know. Yeah. Yes. Yep. And and I just you know I I had lived my entire life supporting my family and that's all I knew. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's so it was a tough decision. But finally, my it, it came to the point where I just knew if I stayed in the marriage, 
who would not survive in a marriage. It was, it was so difficult. And so finally came to the conclusion that I've got to do this. And, I, mm-hmm. and once I started the, the decision-making process, I didn't turn back. Um, and what was your family's reaction to that? Because I think sometimes there's pressure from adult children, like you're breaking up our family, mom. It's your fault. Why you put up with him this long? Why can't you yes. put up with him for another 20 years, right? Well, and because I, I, so I regret that on my own part. That's one of the regrets I have, but I didn't know any better at the time. I only knew what I knew. So I was living my life based on that. But my kids witnessed me putting up with so much bad behavior. And I think probably for the most part, they thought I would just continue to put up with it. But they also witnessed me um, at the very end, just losing it, really like to the point where I feel like I almost had a mental breakdown because I had stayed for such a long time. And so what they witnessed was in their minds, a crazy mom. And then they've got a dad over here looking like he's got it all together. So that was, I'm sure confusing for them. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's been a process. I mean, it's, it's been a process with my kids. Yeah. And Kim, I just want to press pause for a minute and just emphasize that because this is this is very typical in our membership of where a woman has been believing the God hates divorce. I'm going to heroically sacrifice myself Mm -hmm. for the well-being of my family until they get to a point where they are mentally becoming unglued and physically breaking down. Mm -hmm. And then they start walking or speaking or having boundaries or whatever. And they do look like the crazy one because they're Mm -hmm. emotionally dysregulated. They can't, you know, they can't hold it together anymore. They're so broken down. They're depressed or they're angry or they're anxious. And everybody looks at them like, oh, mom's going through, you know, senile senility or you know mm-hmm. menopause, whatever they're going to put on a craziness she's bipolar she you know whatever it is that they're going to label you at borderline um and be careful when you go to a counselor during this stage because a lot of times counselors are not necessarily always trained to discern the difference between a personality disorder and trauma responses and so they will label you that way and especially if you're looking for custody all that kind of stuff it can be very dicey and so this is so important, Karen, and I mean, Kim, Kim, and I'm so glad that you shared this because we let ourselves get to a point of such broken downness mm-hmm. that it's hard to fight for ourselves at that place. So how did you crawl yourself back up? Boy, that's step by step by step. I mean, there were some days, and I, and I see women on the conquer side talking about things like no energy, um, can't function. And there's days like that, that you just don't have energy and you don't function very well. And it, it is not, it's not a six month process. It's not an overnight fix. And I had, I don't know why, but I had in my mind when I divorced, I would take about three weeks off and then I would be okay. I don't, I don't know why I thought that, but I did. And that was not the case. Um, but man, I, I, I know. So when I did divorce, um, I spent a lot, a lot of time. I would get up in the morning and start doing my work from Conquer and start going through the homework, start listening to all the lessons. And I bet I did that for an hour um, each morning. And then we try to work some of the daytime. I uh, had a job where I had some flexibility with work and then a lot of naps, <laughs> a lot of naps and resting and so was it hard for you to care for yourself? It was hard for me to have energy to care for myself. Okay. <laughs> Very hard to have energy to care for myself. But I, I tried to do things like get out for walks um, and start reading about all the things that would help. And so, I, you know, it, 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 gosh, about a year after I divorced, I started feeling a little bit more like myself. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And what was his response to your boundary of I'm not doing this anymore? Oh my gosh. Well, I would say his, the abusive tactics uh, exacerbated themselves during that time. Mm-hmm. I ended up calling the police numerous times. I was afraid of him. Um, I, I was literally, I was scared of him. I mean, I had, I put hotel locks on my bedroom door. I was just so afraid of him. 
-hmm. So um, I think I think these guys were so shocked that we finally stand up to them and say, you're not doing this anymore. And we, and when we wake up to it, I think it's because they get used to controlling us. Mm -hmm. and we, we, I mean, I, I, I guess allowed the control. You make a really good point, Kim, that, and we talk about this in our first module of the Conqueror journey of safety. And sometimes when a woman starts getting stronger, she actually is in a little bit more danger because he mm -hmm. does realize he can't control her anymore. And so his behavior will escalate to see if he can tap you back down mm -hmm. to control and compliance. And when you don't, when you have good boundaries, especially when you're making plans to leave and he knows that, that's your most dangerous time. That's why mm -hmm. we hear of, you know, situations where she was leaving or she left and all of a sudden he flips out. And so you need to understand this. You need to understand how to create safety plans, how to notice what you need to notice, because you're right, oftentimes they might be very covert or very mm -hmm. passive in their abuse in terms of just disrespectful behavior, cheating on you, lying to you, those kind of things. And I'm not saying those don't hurt you, but they're not hitting you and grabbing you and restraining mm -hmm. you, those kind of things. But when you decide to leave, they may escalate those things. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, it did for me. <clears throat> yeah. And so what were some of your safety plans? How did you, how did you protect yourself besides calling the police? Uh, I had a lot, I did a lot of record keeping. I, I did voice recording on my phone really for myself because I wanted proof to myself of what was going on. Mm -hmm. I took a lot of notes. Um, I had friends that were aware of what was going on. I had a very good therapist at the time who was helping me with a lot of trauma. So I had people that, I was checking in with regularly and they were checking in with me that knew what was going on as well as talking to the police. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was not afraid to call the police during that time. Mm -hmm. Good, good. And were the police helpful? Cause sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. Very helpful. Um, so I found I could call, it was not the emergency number. It was the local police department. And so if they, they would, they would listen and you know, here's an example of what happened that so we were sleeping separately but my my husband kept trying to come into the bathroom and i would be in there trying to get ready and he'd walk in and finally i, I called the police and and he said no if he's sleeping in another bedroom and there's a bathroom accessible he should be able to use that bathroom so i told my husband that and i said and here's the name of the policeman i talked to so he, he didn't he didn't believe me so he called the policeman and the policeman said, yes, sir, that is correct. And you should be using another bathroom. So it helped. Mm -hmm. So your husband was willing to listen to that authority. I think they're, and I think they're kind of like little, uh, little boys in men's bodies. They're afraid. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when he knew I was not afraid to, to get someone, someone else to help me out. Okay. So, you said that conquer has taught you to see yourself as God sees you. How has that changed for you? How has, how, how do you see yourself now as compared to how you saw yourself then? Well, so when I first started conquer, I was, you know, reading about the concept of shame. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I thought at the time I didn't have shame until I recognized that when I told myself I'm not enough, that's shame. And I had, that had been my, that had been my mantra my entire marriage was that, that's how I define myself in marriage and all the things that my husband would tell me about myself. I believed when he said I was insecure or I was uh, controlling or argumentative. I just believed all, all of those things mm -hmm. and bit by bit by bit, I've kind of removed those lies from my life and said, that's, that's not who I am. And so, mm -hmm. so your the life, is like how, how the Lord sees me. Yeah. Your life has really changed. So you joined Conquer, you know, in 2018, right? So it's been five years. Yes. Share with the ladies where you're at now. So in 2021, I decided I was brave enough to take a shower and put some clothes on <laughs> and go on a date. <laughs> so I decided to, and I didn't even know what I was doing. I thought I'm just going to get out and get to know some people. That was my goal and I I went on several you know met several people through that but surprisingly God brought a man into my life that um, 
has shown me who I am for what he sees me as. But we we married in 2022 and it's just been, uh, it's been amazing to see how different my life is now Mm -hmm. um, than it was. And to see how different marriage is. I didn't, it's like, this is good. Marriage can be really, really good. And I just did not know that Mm. back then. And someone who would look at me for who I am, my my youngest daughter, this is kind of a neat thing. She over here, she was uh, over at our home in the summertime for her birthday. And she thanked my husband for Mm -hmm. loving me as I am. Mm -hmm. So. I thought that was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. And so your adult children are doing okay? Um, they're, they're slowly starting to accept the reality. It, it's tough because they're accepting that their family is not intact as they knew it. But um, they, they can also see I'm married to a good man and that I'm taken care of and loved and mm-hmm. supported. So, mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. And I think this is really important that as we mature and get healthy, Lisa said yesterday, healthy people live in what is not what they want it to be. Mm -hmm. They live in truth. They live in reality. And so Jesus says, I have no greater joy than to see my children walking in the truth. And I don't think he's talking just about spiritual principles. He's talking about walking in the truth, Mm -hmm. that you are accepting reality and you accepted reality. This is who he is. He doesn't want to change. And I can't continue to live like this. And I think your children, part of our job as parents is to teach our children to accept reality, even when you don't like it, even when it's hard. Mm -hmm. Accepting something doesn't mean we like it. It means that we accept that this is the truth. And that helps us make wise decisions going forward. If I find a breast and a lump in my breast, I don't like that reality. But once I accept, oh my gosh, I have a lump in my breast. It helps me to know what's my next right choice. I better call the doctor to find out what this is. Mm-hmm. Right. But if I don't accept reality and I lie to myself or I pretend it's not there, I'm just going to think positive. Then I put myself in so much more danger. And I think this is what a lot of us do is we want to lie to ourselves. My marriage isn't that bad. He didn't hit me. I don't have a black eye. It's really not abusive. I can do this. God says I should do. And, and all of those kind of lies keep us. And the, and the sickness is getting sicker and sicker. Yes. And that's what I did for a long, long, long time. I just mm-hmm. kept putting my head in the sand or I would. I, you know, try all the things to try and get my, my husband back in line and all those kind of things. And it worked until it didn't work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and where my body was just breaking down because of it. Yeah. Kim, for a woman who's listening, who's been married a long time and is too scared, just like you were too scared to leave, but she's feeling it in her body. What would you have to say to her in closing? So, so my goal for even coming on to share with the women here is to say, Hey, you can, you can heal. You can have a life beyond this. Life can be good. And I think so many of us live in so much fear of the unknown of our husbands, um, not even trusting our own gut, but to know that you can learn how to trust your gut. You can learn how to have a joyful life and to know who you are in the Lord and to believe in yourself. Mm. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your story and coming on and being brave. I think it's very, very honorable and it's also vulnerable to, to share your story. And so I appreciate so much that you did that. Thank you so much. Thank you. (laughs) Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Wow. I hope you're seeing and just seeing yourself seeing yourself in these women's stories, seeing yourself like, oh, if she can do it, maybe I can do it. If she can, after 40 years, still build a life after that, like her life wasn't over. I can still have a life. I can have a future. I don't have to live sick and depressed. God doesn't want me to live that way. Being a martyr for someone else's foolishness, for someone else's sinfulness, is this glorifying God? Or is walking in the truth, as painful as truth may be, is walking in the truth more glorifying to God, even when the truth isn't pretty? Jesus didn't fool himself about what Judas was about to do. He knew exactly what Judas was going to do, and he let him. He didn't stop him. He let Judas decide what Judas was going to do, and Jesus decided what Jesus was going to do. 
what might be possible for you. If you can not give up on your husband, but open your eyes and be respectful enough of him to let him be who he wants to be. And if that's who he wants to be, maybe that is too toxic for you, right? Instead of trying to control him or change him or make him into what you want him to be, maybe he doesn't want to be that. He doesn't want to, he's clearly told you he doesn't want to be that. Who do you want to be? That's your work to do. Your job isn't to change him. And that's a hard thing for us to accept, isn't it? All right, I'm going to bring two more people, two lovely people to our stage, and that is Coach Leanne and Coach Jen. Thank you, Jen, for coming on your vacation. Coach Jen is a coach of ours from Canada, our only Canadian, and we're so happy to have her because she brings a wealth of wisdom, especially in the whole area of sexual betrayal trauma. Um, she's also experienced it herself, and so she personally knows what it's like to go walk through that journey and come through the other side stronger and better than she was before. And her marriage is stronger and better because she was strong enough to get healthy and say, I'm not doing this anymore. Um, and so um, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Where are you at? I'm, I just got back home. I'm on like six hours sleep. So thank you. Thank you okay. for inviting me in on post vacation, but thank you for bringing me in to this ministry. So oh, you're so welcome. We're honored to have you. And then we have Coach Leanne. And Coach Leanne is my buddy who lives in Sun City West near me. Uh, and Co uh, Leanne is a, an amazing um, professional coach. She's coached for years. Um, she does a lot of work in the adoption space as well. But Leanne um, has a heart for God. She's a server. She's a giver. She's a helper. She loves serving people and really helping them, women especially, become their best selves. And I love Leanne. She's also um, learned how to live hard. And she's um, gone through some things in her life that she, you know, none of us have gotten a pass. None of us has gotten an easy pass. Like, okay, I'm going to live the easy life now. And so I think it gives us some credibility to mm -hmm. not just professional credibility, but personal credibility that we've had to actually learn to live out what we're teaching. And Leanne is a beautiful example of that, as is Jen. So welcome, both of you. Yeah. Thank you. What a delight to be here with both of you here in the space. And hey, everybody. Leslie, thanks for bringing us along this journey with you today. Yes, I'm honored. I couldn't do it. I, I, when I was talking about Diana and the, all the rest yeah. of the coaches, our yeah. groups have grown <laughs> so big and our ministry has gotten bigger and bigger. And it's sad, but it's also beautiful that women are starting to say, I, I, I need help. I need, I'm not willing to continue to lose the best of who I am in order to enable the worst in who he is. That's a beautiful phrase from Lisa that we've used in different ways. And I think, you know, when he's acting his worst self, you're not loving him well by enabling that. Mm -hmm. It's not just you're not loving yourself well, you're not loving him well. If you have the opportunity to not enable it. Again, if you're a prisoner of someone who's doing that, you don't say anything, but, but this is different. This is a marriage relationship in which you're called to be, to have his back, to want the best for him. And when he's acting as his worst self, for you to be silent in that is not loving him well. It's not, and we can get so crazy and think it's so kind and generous and mm -hmm. long suffering. And <laughs> right. And in fact, it's, you know, the complete opposite. Yeah. What I'll, I'll let you guys kind of jump in back and forth, but what are your favorite things about helping women kind of wake up and begin to do their conquer journey? Oh, well, go for of, it. Okay, I have to say one of my besties is <laughs> Leanne for over 10 years. So she's got great experience. And so I will turn it over to you. Oh, well, you're so gracious. And I am so thankful for both of you. You know, when I think of where I began in my own, you know, really deep dive journey, both of you women came into my life within two years of each other. Mm. And so for over a decade now, you both have been pouring into my life and teaching me. And then that ripple effect comes right out to our women. And I think one of the things that I appreciate most is... Um, 
we meet women right where they are. No matter what season, no matter what part of their spiritual life, physical life, emotional life, social life, no matter where they are relationally with themselves, with others, and with God, we meet them right where they are. This is a no judgment zone. We're very loving and curious community that wants to walk alongside of you as you discover more of who you are, who the people in your life are, and how you fit together. It's complicated. And I think the other thing that I really appreciate is conquer is a safe space to land. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to say that one more time. Mm -hmm. It's a safe space to land. It was safe for me. It has been safe for thousands of women, and it continues to be safe. I even see it in the feed today. So whether you have been here a minute or a million hours, we see you and we hear you. And I think Conquer offers up an opportunity to learn to be loved. And... Um, I'm going to get a little bit juicy because <laughs> some of us, me included, had a very hard time learning to give and receive love in healthy ways because of some of the destructive behavior in our lives. And so Conquer gives us that. We also learn to put Jesus at the center when so many of us have put our relationships, our roles, our education at the center. And so I'm just going to pause there because I feel like there's so much to add, but I want to turn it over to the lovely Jen and um, we're just going to tag off of each other because we just love this space. <laughs> we love it. Is that okay with you, Leslie? Yeah, I'm just going to sit back and let you Okay, guys sit back because we're on fire, right? We're on fire for conquer because we want to conquer our hearts. We want to conquer with Jesus alongside of him. There are so many times, so bear with me. I'm just a little jet lagged and fresh on <laughs> fresh off a trip from Italy where you get to see all the cathedrals and all the things. And I, I get that might be different religions for different people, but it's the presence of Jesus in the Roman era that, you know, I've experienced before, but I'm experiencing again as a born again Christian. And it was so different for me this time. So I want you to know that I'm here today more than ever, <laughs> but I'm here for you knowing that we're going to do this. We get to conquer the enemy because every time I walk around, I'm like, that's the enemy, but this is Jesus. That's the enemy. This is Jesus. And we're going to help you kind of figure out when it's that and when it's not. So we're loving on you all through this time. And that's what I love most about this ministry is that Leslie, and thank you, you've given us as coaches and under your wing, um, the idea that we can share this kind of concept. Like I just came back from a vacation but I can share what my experience was in Christ. Leanne can share with you everything that she's experienced. So we want that for you the most. We really do. And I think this is what makes our organization quite unique from other organizations is that it's not about bashing your husbands. Your husbands are broken people. It's not about demonizing him and you know you stick up for your rights and all that kind of stuff yes god calls you to steward your one precious life he calls you to be healthy he says he wants you to mature he wants you to it says in in first thessalonians it is god's will 
that you mature and live a holy life. And if someone you're married to keeps you down and squashes your maturity, like Jennifer's husband tried to, because it threatens his. And then we believe as our wife that we have to bury our seed because if I grow into an oak tree and he's just a, an elm tree and I'm bigger than him, that's going to threaten him. So I'm not allowed to. But if God made you to be an oak tree, why wouldn't your husband say, go for that? Be the biggest, beautifulest oak tree you could be. That's what a good husband would do. He would want you to be all that God made you to be. And if he needed to water you, he would and vice versa. That's what a marriage is supposed to be like. And when you're in a marriage where someone continues to demean, disrespect, dominate, deceive and degrade you, this is not a marriage. You might be legally married, but it is not a marriage. It is an oppressive, oppressor, victim relationship. And there might be those relationships when you're a prisoner of war, or like in, in what we're reading in the news right now, and in the Israeli occupation and all of that, there's prisoners of war and they're not treated very well. But this is not God's will for marriage. And don't let anyone fool you into thinking it is. Leslie, thank you. <laughs> you know, because we can be fooled. And I think that's another thing that I appreciate about Conquer so much that we bring truth and we're not afraid to talk about the hard things. Mm -hmm. We've got real issues. Mm -hmm. We've got real women with struggles that um, are heartbreaking every single day. And we're going to bring real truth and we're going to peel back the layers together and you don't have to do it alone. Mm -hmm. And there's so much strength when we can do it together. One of the things that I think is really important about our community that I would love for you guys to talk about, I'll talk about the in-person part, and I'd like you guys to talk about the online part. So we have two components. One is online, and we have a big online support group on Facebook in a private setting, which we're pretty rabid about confidentiality in there. And then also, whenever I or even if one of the coaches were going somewhere and they wanted to meet up with Conquer Girls, we put that out on the Facebook page and say, hey, Conquer Girls, like I'm going to North Carolina next week to be with Lisa and her retreat. And before I start at Lisa's house, I'm flying in on Wednesday and we have about 15 Conquer women who are going to meet me at the airport for dinner. We're going to have dinner. We're going to love on each other. And my goal in doing that wherever I travel is to, I was just in Canada and I met the women um, in, in um, Vancouver. So when we do that, my goal isn't for you to meet me, although that may be your goal a little bit, but my goal is for you to meet each other because we mm -hmm. have pockets of women all around the country and we're, we're hoping all around the world. When I was in England, I met with Conquer Women. We would love for you to meet each other so that there is a, foot on the ground, boots on the ground community of people that you have your back. If you need something or you're stressed out about something or, or you need prayer, it's not just an online person, but it's an in-person person that you might be able to call and, 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 and connect with or just go to a movie together when your kids are with their dads and you don't have to feel so lonely. And this woman, you don't have to explain yourself. Or you're not worried about being questioned about your marriage. They know where you're at. And so these are important components to our community aspect of conquer that I think are life changing and nourishing to that little seed that you've not watered very often in your life and no one's watered you. And we want to water you and help you grow into the person that God called you to be. Yeah. Life changing and life giving. So I just had the privilege this week to meet with two conquer sisters right here in Phoenix for breakfast. We had three hours together and it was so refreshing. All of us are navigating really challenging things right now. And to be able to sit knee to knee with others who get you, and you don't have to explain yourself, your story or anything over and over again, whether you're online mm -hmm. yeah. or sitting knee to knee, it's, I can't even tell you. I was so full when I left those sisters. That's the amazing thing, right? Leanne and Leslie, it's like, this is about connection. That's one of our three C's. It's amazing how much we can connect throughout the world. That's been my biggest thing because I'm from Canada. So it's not often that I get a chance, even through whatever, 
that I get to connect through my country. But when I meet all of you, and then I meet women from Australia and Italy and um, Asia, and Bali, it's just like, wow. It means that we're all connected under one umbrella and it's God's umbrella. That's what I love, but mm -hmm. we're all connected. And I've been a part of it personally and professionally. So, wow. Thank you, Leslie. Yeah, it's it's been my pleasure. I think that seeing women come alive in community has been and learning to have a safe community and what does a safe community look like and what do trusting relationships look like and what does healthy look like. Sometimes we didn't grow up that way. We're not married that way. Our church isn't that way. We have no idea. It just feels normal to be so dysfunctional. And so to really have an experience of healthy can be life changing. Tell me, tell some of the women as you've been walking women through Conquer, what are some of the outcomes that you see as they're doing their work? What are some of the outcomes that you see, the progress that they're making in their lives that you've been privileged to witness? Okay, so this one is really fun. Do you mind if I go first, Jen? No, no, of course. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this is really fun for me because as I was thinking about this, it's these subtle little changes that one step at a time become very big things. All right. So I want to share, a, I'm going to give you a word picture here for a minute based on my life experience this morning. So this is in real time for me. I joined a bowling league. I haven't bowled <laughs> for over 30 years. I was with a group of women this morning right here in my community who I didn't know. And I was bowling really awful my first game. There was women who were willing to speak into my life this morning and give me little tweaks, okay, on my game. I bowled a 60 this morning in my very first game. We bowled three games together. My second game was 120, double the score. My third game, 119. Wow. Okay. And I, I know they're not, for those of you who are bowlers, I know that's still low. My goal is just to break a hundred. <laughs> okay. But here's the deal. And this is what I see in Conquer over and over again. Women willing to walk aside, walk alongside other women with no ego, no pride and a realness and be willing to give mm -hmm. feedback. Yes. Little bits of feedback that can change the entire game of life for them. Yeah. My big change she gave me, I was releasing my ball like this. All she said was, Leanne, turn your wrist. Yeah. Just like that. That was one tweak that I did and I doubled my score. And it also helped me to look at my tattoo, living water. <laughs> as I was releasing my ball. So I was able to say, Jesus, this is for you. This is why I'm here. And what do you have me to learn today? Okay. So this is powerful. That's what I see in Conquer with the women. They're connecting. They're making small shifts that bring big dividends. And it's something I didn't even think about. I couldn't see it in myself that I was releasing my ball crooked. I didn't know it was going across my body. I didn't know what I was doing. I needed other people to observe so that I could see things. I have blind spots. Conquer helps us get rid of those blind spots that we don't know that we have. And I think the other shift that I've seen that I'm super excited about is women get creativity back into their life. Mm -hmm. Just like your painting behind you, Leslie. We have spoken with women in our Conquer group who quit playing piano instruments. They quit doing things that they loved, whether it be sports or art or whatever, because they didn't have the mental capacity or the bandwidth to do them anymore. And by doing this work, creativity enters in. So there's courage, confidence, and creativity is what I see really get um, unleashed in them again. So they're meeting themselves again and uh, coming home to themselves, I would say. 
That's great, great. You know, Jennifer, I want to hear your your comments as well. But two things: one is uh, moderator, whoever you are, somebody wants to put a private comment or ask a private question. So if you could give her a link to do that, she could do that. Um, but I was on the chat this morning, and I don't often respond, but I do read them. And here's a conquer woman asking a question: Who do you ask, who would you ask? Which girlfriend of yours would you ask this question? But this is the kind of questions we. Have. I'm separated from my husband. What do I do with my sexual desire? It's going off. It's going off the charts. Right now, 40 people respond because and isn't it amazing that you can ask such a vulnerable, honest question? Like, I feel really horny and I don't know what to do. And you get a bunch of different answers of what they're doing and no one's shaming. Like, oh, we don't talk about that here. This is a Christian group. Right. This is how real our women are with one another. And I think that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. I think it's beautiful that you have you have this question. Who do you ask? You're not going to ask your mother. You're not going to ask because they may not know. They're not separated. And here you go. That's the kind of community we have in our Conquer membership. Jen. Oh, wow. Where do I start? <laughs> if I can take off from what you just said, Leslie, I'm always about what you can stop, what you can start, and what you can keep doing. Stop, start, and keep doing. So what do I need to start? Stop, sorry. What do I need to start? And what do I need to keep doing? Because I think that's the biggest thing. So God's in all of it. I mean, there's no question <laughs> about what we need to stop, start, and keep doing. But in the worldly and in the flesh, ask yourself, what do I need to stop, start, and keep doing? So Leanne gave amazing examples about bowling, right? Like, and how you feel. So I want you to look at what's your similar example. If you don't bowl, that's okay. What would you do to stop, start, and keep doing to be successful in life? Whether it's your marriage, whether it's your sport, whether it's your hobby, whether it's just like whatever, living life. You know, for me, I question this all the time. What do I need to stop, start and keep doing? Okay. Mm -hmm. So my husband is a recovering sex addict and we've been doing this for a long time. So stop that, start recovery. Um, what do I need to keep doing is living my best life. That's what conquer is all about. That's what we're here for. That's what we love. It's living by Jesus. It's loving by him. And that's what I want for all of us that are here together. Because we've been in difficult, destructive marriages. And I thank Leslie for bringing that to light that it's okay if we feel awkward, if we're not sure. Whatever it is that we're feeling about this discomfort, it's okay. We're allowed to feel that. So we're not saying if it's right or wrong right now. We're just saying come to a place where it's okay to just feel it and be with sisters that understand because we're going to conquer this together. Mm -hmm. That's what conquer is all about. In my opinion, that's what brought me here. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And you know, there's a lot that you don't know yet, ladies, but there are some things you do know. And so again, Leanne didn't know that she should turn her wrist, but she did know that bowling involved bowling involved throwing the ball. Right. And so she knew what she did, what she knew, and invited feedback on what she didn't know, or even didn't invite it, people just offered her feedback. She didn't have to take it. Just like we offer our husbands, hey, I think if you talk to your child this way, it might work out better, and they don't listen, right? But Leanne took the feedback and she tried it. Oh my gosh, I hit all the pins this time, you know? So she realized that that did work. And so sometimes taking the feedback and trying it, trying the next right step, trying something that we suggest in Conquer, trying to have a boundary, trying to, hey, just go take a walk. Maybe you'll feel better. 
and I took a walk and I didn't feel like it, but I did it. And oh, I did feel better. I felt a whole lot better. Try turning off the TV at 10 o'clock and just going to bed and, you know, reading a book until you fall asleep. Maybe that will help you feel better. You know, all the different things that we don't do that we might just take a little tweak like that and do it and notice that, wow, I do feel better. That did help me. And then build on that so that you are continuing to take charge of stewarding your one precious life. And that's what the community helps you do. Um, and certainly there's a library full of videos that you can watch and do the homework with that. And so there's the content, there's the community, and there's the connection that are all really important for your healing and your growth. And so we really hope that you give yourself a gift and just do it. Just start conquer and start doing your work and say, hey, my marriage, I can't be in total charge of or control of, and I'm in charge of me and how I show up there. And right now I'm not showing up very well because I'm so angry or I'm so depleted. And so right now I need to take care of me and that will help me think more clearly. So I need to know what to do with us. I can't make us decision until I can start thinking about me decision. And that might be a place to start. So thanks guys so much for being with us. I'm going to move on to our next Conquer interview, but I appreciate you and talk to you soon. All right, we have one more Conquer woman who's going to share her 